Hello my dear students I am Akash Gupta again and I welcome you all on Physics Wala English So today we will learn a new topic the fourth chapter of electrodynamics which is magnetic effect of current okay So in this uh, chapter we will first learn how to calculate magnetic field due to current and there are two laws which will help us as coulomb's law was helping us to find electric field here the biosmart law and ampere's law will help us to find electric field sorry magnetic field due to current okay then we will learn the forces that charges experience inside magnetic field and uh, this the force is called lorentz force and uh, uh, we will also learn the force experienced by current carrying conductors the torque experienced by uh, current carrying loops in external magnetic field and that will be covered in ampere's force and ampere torque okay so uh, let's begin the story okay students actually till 1850 scientist did not know what is the true nature and what is the true source of magnetism we were using magnets since almost 8th century people were using magnets for navigation we were uh, using compass which are uh, which are made of uh, natural magnets okay uh, people used magnets for playing they used magnets for entertainment but nobody knew what is the true source of magnetism as we know that electricity is produced by electric charge but what is the source of magnetism nobody knew till 1850 then accidentally few scientists discovered that the magnetic field is produced by nothing but electric charges okay when we put an electric charge at rest it produces only electric field and that we studied in electrostatics but when the charge it starts moving it also creates a magnetic field in addition to electric field so remember what produces magnetic field always always a moving charge produces magnetic field okay what is current current is actually nothing but moving charge okay when we pass current in say some conductor there are two kind of charges it has positive ions positive ions and equal number of free electrons ions positive ions are positively charged and free electrons are negatively charged so they both create electric field around it around the, uh, the wire and both field because of having opposite nature they cancel each other because one is produced by positive charge one is produced by negative charge but since the positive ions are at rest and free electrons move in the direction opposite to current so these moving free electrons produce magnetic field okay they, these free moving electrons produce magnetic field and that is why we say a current carrying wire produces magnetic field okay so <clears throat> if we want to calculate the magnetic field produced by a current carrying wire we will have to fundamentally use a biosmart law okay so uh, it is actually you can say a brother of coulomb's law which was very useful uh, for finding electric field here we use biosmart law for finding magnetic field okay actually if you want to calculate magnetic field by the entire wire this law can can help you but if you uh, divide that entire wire into small elements then this law help you to find magnetic field because of a tiny current element ideal at and you can find obviously the magnetic field at a distance r from that element so uh, let me tell you what i'm saying suppose if we have a wire like this and a current i is flowing in this okay in the beginning if you uh, are asked what is the field created by this wire obviously it is very difficult but this law tells you about the magnetic field produced by a small element of this wire so suppose this element is dl dl is the length of this element current is flowing in this direction upward direction we call this dl a vector dl 
always remember we call this dl a vector dl and the direction of dl is taken as in the direction of current so this is the direction of dl conventionally and taking this dl as origin if we want to calculate magnetic field at a position vector of r from this let's say at point p the magnetic field according to bartsovert law at point p because of this element is given by db at point p is given by mu not by 4 pi what is mu not we will learn but it is a constant right now mu not by 4 pi i dl cross r cap divided by r square this is the bowed sovert law okay we can also write it as db at p is equal to mu naught i divided by 4 pi dl cross sorry it was actually unit vector r so we can write dl cross unit vector r can be written as r vector by magnitude of r so replacing r unit vector as r vector divided by r in the denominator it becomes r cube okay so this is the expression for magnetic field balsovert law balsovert discovered it using many experiments okay so this is the fundamental law that help you to find magnetic field okay so when you find magnetic field because of this element obviously you can find magnetic field of all elements and by summing them vectorially you will know the magnetic field produced by the entire wire at point p okay let us learn what is the direction of this magnetic field because that is the i think most difficult part of this chapter direction because it involves cross product okay so uh, let me first tell you what is direction as you can see the magnetic field is in the direction of dl cross r dl cross r so by using the uh, right hand rule i will first point my fingers in the direction of dl can you see that i'll first point my fingers in the direction of dl and i'll turn them in the direction of r from dl to r from dl to r and can you see the thumb is pointing inward so the thumb the direction of thumb tells you the direction of magnetic field so thumb is pointing inward so at point p we have magnetic field inward always remember the magnetic field will be in the direction perpendicular to the plane containing dl and r so if dl and r are both in this plane of the screen the magnetic field will be perpendicular to this screen okay suppose someone wants to find magnetic field here at the point q okay we will take origin as dl and we will draw another vector let's say r dash again at this point q the magnetic field direction can be given by the same law but here at this point the magnetic field will be in the direction of dl cross r dash vector and because of this formula dl cross r so if you put your fingers if you align your fingers in the direction of dl and turn them in direction of r means from dl to r from dl to r dash okay can you see the thumb is pointing outward and if thumb is pointing outward the magnetic field at point q would be outward and outward field is represented by a dot i think you remember okay so at any point if you want to find magnetic field use right hand rule for cross product and uh, right and uh, turn your fingers from dl towards r and the direction of thumb will give direction of magnetic field okay the magnetic field is also called magnetic induction and sometimes it is called magnetic flux density but mostly we use magnetic field okay 
and the SI unit of the magnetic field is Tesla. We represent it by letter T or Weber per meter square. Okay, Weber per meter square. The mu naught term that you studied in Bauer's Robert law is called magnetic permeability of free space of free space and the value mu naught in SI units is given by 4 pi times 10 to the power minus 7 in SI units. Yes. The magnetic field lines are actually different from electric field lines. As I think you remember, the electric field lines were open curves. They started from positive charge and terminate at negative charge. So, they were open curves starting and ending at different points. But magnetic field lines are actually closed curves. So, actually magnetic field lines, they form closed loops around the source that created it. So, if you try to imagine the magnetic field lines across this wire, they will be like closed loops. Okay. The coming from coming out outward from this side, rotating like this and going into from point P. So, they form closed loops around the source. So, we will learn them in the specific cases. Let us move a little. Okay. So, let me first tell you how to find magnetic field due to current carrying ring at its center. So, I have assumed a ring and let us say the current I is flowing in the ring in counterclockwise direction. Okay. As bios law tells you about magnetic field by a single current element. So, let me take a current element in it. Okay. As the current is anti-clockwise, I will take this as DL element and as you know, the direction of DL is in the direction of current. So, that is why I am taking DL towards left. As I ha have to find current at center, I will join element to the center, right? And I will call this a vector R. Okay, it's very obvious that magnitude of vector R is equal to radius of the ring. So, let us say the radius of the ring is also R. Okay, now according to Bauer's Robert law, the magnetic field due to this element at center can be written as dB. Let me write the magnitude only. So, dB will be mu naught upon 4 pi i now i have dl cross r vector did you remember dl cross r so i'll write dl cross r vector divided by r cube let me write vector here also and in the next line i'll write magnitude so let's write magnitude now db db will be mu naught divided by 4 pi i. I think you remember dl cross r is dl r sine theta and let us see what is the angle between dl and r. I think you all agree with me that dl is tangential to the loop and r is radial and as there is a 90 degree angle between tangent and radius, the angle between dl and, L and r will be 90. So, I will write sin 90 here and divided by r cube. Now, you can cancel 1 r from here and sin 90 is 1. Okay. So, db will be equal to, the magnitude will be equal to mu naught i dl divided by 4 pi r square. So, that is the magnitude of magnetic field vector at the center because of this dl. Now, let us find its direction. Okay. As you know, the direction of dB is in the direction of dl cross r. So, I will point my fingers in the direction of dl. Can you see that? And I will turn them towards r. And can you see the dl cross r is pointing outward because my thumb is 
pointing outward. So the magnetic field because of this element at center is outward. So this dB is towards outward. Okay. But let me try few more elements. Okay. So suppose I take one more element here. The DL is downward because current here is downward. Direction of DL is changed. This will be the new vector R because R always points from DL to the point where we wish to find magnetic field. And can you see the DL cross R is, is still outward because magnetic field is in the direction of DL cross R. I am uh, turning my fingers from fingers of right hand from DL to R and the thumb is, a stick, is still pointing outward. So, magnetic field because of this element is also outward. You take any other element, let us say here, R will be like this. And now if you calculate, if you check the direction of magnetic field, see DL cross R, from DL to R, turn your fingers and the thumb is still up pointing outward. So, now by this observation, we know that the every element of the loop will create magnetic field outward at the center. So, all these vectors are parallel and pointing in same direction. And you know, if all vectors point in same direction, the net uh, sum will be given by the summing all dv. So, I can say the net field at center, b at center is equal to integral of db or integral of mu naught i dl divided by 4 pi r square. As you know, mu naught by 4 pi is constant. The i is same, i is a scalar and it is same in every element. So, i is same, you can take it out. r, the radius, this is the, this is not r vector, it is magnitude of r vector that is radius. A radius is also same for all element. This radius is equal to this radius. Okay, that is why I am taking this also outside integration sign. So, we will have mu naught i divided by 4 pi r square and integral d. Yes. Now, can you see this dl? This dl is magnitude of dl. Means, it is the length of element. Okay, and if you add all length of element, you will end up at circumference because the sum of all dl will be equal to circumferential length of this loop. So, integral dl can be written as 2 pi r, the circumferential length. So, it becomes b equals mu naught i divided by 4 pi r square mu naught i divided by 4 pi r square times 2 pi r. Let us cancel 1 r pi 2 and we have b equals mu naught i divided by 2 r. That is the value or magnitude of magnetic field due to a current element or current carrying ring, sorry, current carrying ring at its center and the direction. So, as we had the ring like this, the current like this and center. At center, magnetic field was outward. So, you can think of a simple law that if you turn the fingers or you can or you curl your fingers in the direction of current. Remember, if you curl your fingers in the direction of current like this, the thumb gives you the direction of magnetic field at the center of the ring. Okay. So, always remember this point. Okay. And let us move for next. This time, I do not have a complete ring. I only have a part of the ring, one part of the ring. Okay. And this part of the ring is called arc and this arc is making an angle alpha at the center. So, if this arc makes angle alpha at the center, okay, again I can take one element of it, 
let's say dl the direction of dl will be in the direction of current and i can take this as r vector if i write the db that is magnetic field because of this element it, it will be same as it was in the case of a ring and again i can write the magnitude db as mu naught i divided by 4 pi r square integral dl not no not r square dl now again here if you find the direction of magnetic field i'll what i'll do i i'll point my fingers in the direction of dl and i'll turn them towards r so dl to r can you see the thumb is pointing inward and the thumb is pointing inward the magnetic field is actually inward and if you take other elements also, you will find that magnetic field is pointing inward because of every element. So, I can sum these uh, magnetic fields and to find net magnetic field at center, let us integrate it. Obviously, mu naught i upon 4 pi r square will be common and we will have integral dl here. But this time, the integral dl will give you the length of this arc only. And as you know, the length, the arc length is equal to the radius times angle. The radius times angle, it will be mu naught i divided by 4 pi r square and the length of r, which is radius times the angle. So, we have r cancelled and I can write it as this mu naught i divided by 2r and here I can write alpha divided by 2 pi. Please check this. So, this is the magnetic field at the center of a circular arc. Okay. Direction. As we learned that for finding magnetic field because of a ring, we have to curl our fingers of right hand in the direction of current. So, let us do that. See, the current is this time clockwise. So, I am curling my right hand fingers clockwise and see the thumb is pointing inward and if thumb is pointing inward, the magnetic field is inward. Okay. This is actually the fraction or you can say the part of the arc with respect to a full circle. Okay. So, if you have a full circle, okay, you have to put alpha equals to 2 pi and 2 pi by 2 pi will be 1 and we will get magnetic field at the center of a ring that is mu naught by 2 r. But if you have a semi circle, put alpha equals to pi only. If you have a quarter circle, put alpha equals to pi by 2 only okay. and that will give you the magnetic field because of that arc. Now, there is a very important point. Suppose, instead of having a single turn coil, you have a multi turn coil. Like in this ring, you have n turns. And if ring has n turns, ring has n turns carrying I current in every turn, I current in every turn. At one place, at one cross section, effectively there are n turns, so there are n wires, each having I current, so effective current will be would be n i, and then the magnetic field is written as mu naught n i divided by two r. Okay, so this is the magnetic field because of a uh, n turn coil. So let us solve few problems based on this. In this question, they say a long wire, we had a long wire in carrying a steady current is bent into a loop of one turn. So, suppose we had a wire of length L and it is bent into a loop of one turn carrying current I. And at the center, the magnetic field is B. Okay. So, I am assuming the current is I and the magnetic field in the first case is actually B1, let us say B1, oh sorry, they are saying B, so B is actually mu naught I divided by 
to r where r is the radius of loop okay now what they have done now they say it is then bent into a circular coil of n turns suppose you make a circular coil of n turns obviously the size will reduce because we are increasing the number of turns now they have n turns okay the rate this radius we assumed as r but let us say this radius is r dash the new radius is r dash okay as you know the length is same so here i can say l is equal to 2 pi r the circumference but here i can say the length will be equal to n times of circumference which is 2 pi r dash as there are n terms if you make them equal, RH is equal, you will find R equals N times R dash. So, new R dash is actually 1 upon N times R. So, this time if you find the new magnetic field B dash, it would be as magnetic field because of uh, N turn coil is mu naught N i divided by, but the radius is r dash to r dash but you know r dash is r by n so i'll write r divided by n this n will jump and reach here and you will see mu naught n square i divided by 2r so can you see the b dash is n square times the old b so correct answer is c n square b okay over to next question. In this question, they say the current loop having two circular arc joined by two radial lines as shown. So, we have this kind of loop. There are two radial lines and two circular arc. Carrying current in this way. And they are asking us to find magnetic field at the center O. Okay. So, let me first tell you how to calculate magnetic field because of these radial lines. To calculate magnetic field because of these radial lines, listen carefully, it is very important. I will take one DL element here. So, this is DL. I am trying to apply bounds of law. And if this is DL, the R points from dl to the point we are wishing to find magnetic field so this is r and can you see the dl and r are in same direction the dl and r are in same direction the angle between them is zero so if you wish to find magnetic field because of this element the magnetic field because of this element would be again mu naught i divided by 2 pi sorry 4 pi 4 pi r cube and here I will write dl cross r vector. As dl cross r is dl r sin theta and theta is 0 here. So, you know sin theta is 0 and if sin theta is 0, this db is 0 because dl and r are parallel and you know cross product of two parallel vectors is 0. So, magnetic field at origin at O because of this element will be 0. Similarly, I can say if you take any element on this radial wire, for every element, the DL and R are in same direction. So, they will all have 0 magnetic field at origin. So, magnetic field because of this radial wire at origin is 0. Okay. If I think of this wire here, the DL is pointing downward. The R is pointing backward. So, angle between R and DL is 180 now. But I think you remember sin 180 is again 0. So, because of this element 2, the magnetic field at O will be 0. So, because of these all elements in this wire also, the magnetic field at O is 0. Because of this logic, you always remember if you have a straight segment of wire, the magnetic field at any point 
in the line of this wire, whether in front or in back, magnetic field is zero at all the points lying in the line of the wire. Okay. Now we are left with only two arcs. These two, these are two arcs, and that make angle 45 degree at center. So, and and one more thing is there. The magnetic field at O because of this arc, I'll curl my fingers in the direction of current and my thumb is pointing outward. So, because of this arc 1, the magnetic field B1 is outward. Can you see that? And magnetic field because of arc 2, as current is flowing like this, I'll curl my fingers like this and thumb is pointing inward. So, magnetic field because of wire 2, will be inward. So, net magnetic field because of opposite directions will be B1 minus B2. So, let me write B net equals B1 minus B2. What is B1? Let me apply the formula. So, B1 is mu naught I divided by 2R. What is R? Can you see? R is 3 centimeter. Let me first write R1 times alpha divided by 2 pi. Alpha is 45 here. Let me write 2 pi in degrees. So, 2 pi in degrees is 360. So, I can write 45 divided by 360. Okay. Minus B2. B2 would be again mu naught, the same current here divided by 2R2. Can you see R2 is 5 centimeter. R2 is 5 centimeter here. So, I will write R2, 2 times R2. And again, this arc also makes 45 degree angle at, this, at the center. So, 45 degree divided by 360. Okay. You can take common. The current is equal to 10 ampere. So, I will write mu naught multiplied by 10 divided by 2 and this factor is 45 by 360 is 1 by 8. So, I will have 2 multiplied by 8 and inside we have 1 upon 3 centimeter. I can write 3 by 100 as in meters minus 1 upon 5 centimeter that is 100 upon 5. If you put the value of mu naught as 4 pi 10 to the power minus 7 and calculate it, you will find answer is nearly 1 times 10 to the power minus 5 units, that is Tesla. So, correct answer is B. Okay. Over to next question. Here they give us two circular arcs A and B. They are not complete circles. A is actually 90 degrees short or you can say 90 degree missing and B arc is 60 degree missing, right? B arc is 60 degree missing. A has a current of 2 ampere in it. B has a current of 3 ampere. A has a radius of 2 centimeter. B has a radius of 4 centimeter, right? And both carry current in equal same sense. So, magnetic field created by both will be in same direction. We have to find the ratio of magnetic field due to wire A and B. So, let us first find magnetic field because of wire A. As you know, magnetic field because of current carrying arc is equal to mu naught times current. Current is 2 ampere here divided by 2 times radius. Radius is 0 0.02 because it is in centimeters. I have converted into meters multiplied by alpha upon 2 pi. See, angle of A is actually 360 minus 90, that is 270. 270. And writing 2 pi in degrees, I will write 360. So, this is the magnetic field of A and magnetic field of B would be mu naught 3 ampere divided by twice of radius, radius is 0 0.04 and angle made by this arc at center is actually 
360 minus this 60, that is 300. So, I'll write 300 divided by 360. So, now if you divide these two BA upon BB, BA upon BB, actually the B is proportional to current. So, I'll have I1 by I2. So, I1 by I2 is 2 by 3, that is 2 by 3. Then it is inversely proportional to radius. So, I will be having these, this ratio as proportional to R2 by R1 and R2 by R1 would be 4 by 2 that is 2. R2 by R1 is 2. Can you see that? And again 270 divided by 300 that is 270 divided by 300. Let us cancel this and I will have 4 by 3 multiplied by uh, 27 by 30 is actually 4 by 3 multiplied by, uh, let us cancel by 3, we will have 9 by 10, 9 by 10. So, cancel once more, you will have 6 by 5 as final answer. So, correct option is B, 6 upon 5. Okay. So, now you have learned how to calculate magnetic field due to current carrying ring or loop or current carrying circular arc. What if the wire is a straight? Suppose we have a straight wire and it is carrying current I as shown in the figure and we want to find magnetic field at some point P which is not in the line of wire because if you take any point in the line of wire, magnetic field would be zero. I think you remember from previous questions. So, we have to find magnetic field at point P. The distance, the minimum distance between point P and the wire is R. You can also call it perpendicular distance R and from this reference line, the position vector or po angular position of topmost end of the wire is theta 1 and angular position of lowermost wire is theta 2 with respect to this line, okay, with respect to this perpendicular line. So, actually, if you, if you wish to find magnetic field because of this wire at point P, the right formula is b equals to mu naught i divided by 4 pi r, r means the perpendicular distance times sin theta 1 plus sin theta 2. You will have to remember this. This is very important. Okay. And let me tell you what is the direction. So, for direction, if I take some element here, dl, I think you remember the direction of dl is in the direction of current. So, I have taken it upward. This will be the R vector. Okay. And let us make DL cross R. So, I will put my fingers in the direction of DL and I will turn them towards R. And can you see the thumb is pointing inward? The thumb is pointing inward. So, magnetic field at this point because of this element is inward. You take any other element and you will again see the DL pointing upward and R going this way. So, DL cross R is always inward as far as this point is concerned. So, magnetic field because of every element is inward and again by using bias over law and doing some integrations, you can find this result. Okay. So, magnetic field here is inward. If you, if you want to find magnetic field here, so magnetic field here would be the DL is like this and R will be like this. All DL will be pointing upward and all R will be like this or this or this means pointing leftward. So, DL cross R is pointing outward. The thumb is pointing outward. Okay. So, that is why the magnetic field here would be this. I also told you that magnetic field lines form closed loops. So, actually the magnetic field lines around this wires are closed loops like this. They are coming out from the screen like this. They are turning like this and they are going into the screen like this and again behind the screen they are moving like this. Okay. So, that is the simple pattern of magnetic field and if this is the situation, please remember this formula. If theta 1 and theta 2 are same, if theta 1 and theta 2 are same, that is a very important case, if theta 1 and theta 2 are same and C it is equal to theta means you are finding, you are trying to find magnetic field at a perpendicular bisector of the wire. 
बिकॉज फॉर द केस ऑफ परपेंडिकुलर बाई फैक्टर थीटा वन एंड थीटा टू वुड बी सेम पुट साइन थीटा वन एस साइन थीटा साइन टू थीटा टू एस साइन थीटा एंड यू विल गेट बी एस म्यू नॉट आई साइन थीटा डिवाइडेड बाय टू पाई आर ओके लेट्स मूव अ लिटिल हियर वी हैव मैग्नेटिक फील्ड यू टू अ लॉन्ग स्ट्रेट वायर सो इफ वायर इज लॉन्ग इनफ दैट यू कैन थिंक ऑफ अ इनफाइनाइट वायर and we are wishing to find field at point p the uppermost point or the topmost point of the wire is so far that if you try to touch it from point p this angle would nearly be 90 of pi by 2 and as wire is too long in the uh, downward direction also if you try to touch that point p that point from p this angle would to be nearly pi by 2 so if we put theta 1 and theta 2 as pi by 2 in our previous formula sin 90 will be 1 sin 90 will be 1 and we will left with b equals mu not i divided by 2 pi r as an answer this is very important this is very important always remember if we have an infinitely long wire if we have a infinitely long wire and we are wishing to find magnetic field at some place at a distance r from the wire the magnetic field is given by mu not i by 2 pi r if you cut the lower wire and you are left with only the upper wire the magnetic field will get half like if you have this kind of wire which is infinitely long in the upward direction only and this is the distance r this is the point p obviously the field at point p now becomes half of total and that is equals to mu not i divided by 2 not 2 4 pi r if you wish to find direction of magnetic field now we can always find direction using right hand rule or cross product rule but still for some uh, ease of calculation we have a new law which is like this right hand rule again this time if wire is straight point your thumb in the direction of wire point your thumb in the direction of wire and point your fingers towards the point where you wish to find magnetic field okay so if i wish to find magnetic field here i'll turn like this see my thumb is pointing towards the current and my fingers are pointing towards the point p where we want to find magnetic field just curl your fingers and can you see the fingers are going inward if fingers are going inward means here we have magnetic field inward if some of you wants to find magnetic field here at say point q let us repeat i will point thumb in the direction of current i will point my fingers towards the point and i will call them now and can you see the fingers are coming out if fingers are coming out then magnetic field here is outward this is the direction of magnetic field so as i already told you that here magnetic field lines fo form closed loops so actually the magnetic field lines are coming from this and then going from this and they are forming closed loop like this around the wire so that is about the magnetic field created by a straight wire this is a very good question based upon magnetic field because of uh, straight wires so here we have a 50 turn hexagonal coil of side length 10 cm so this is 10 cm a current i is flowing in it in every turn and in this coil or hexagon there are 50 similar turns okay so the effective value of i you can say is 50 i okay so let us find first the magnetic field because of one edge okay ab and then we will try to add vectorially the magnetic field because of all the edges okay let us first 
check the direction of magnetic field at the center. Okay. If I point my thumb in the direction of current, right, and point my fingers towards the point where I want to calculate magnetic field and I curl my fingers, can you see the fingers are coming out? If fingers are coming out here, the curls of finger give you direction of magnetic field. So, magnetic field at this point would be outward. Okay. If you check the magnetic field direction because of other wires, see, direction of current, fingers and fingers are coming out. So, magnetic field because of this wire too is coming outward. Magnetic field because of this wire is also coming outwards. Magnetic field because of every wire is coming outward. So, you can say the uh, all magnetic fields are in same direction. And if you find magnetic field because of one, as there are six edges, simply multiplying them, simply multiplying this magnetic field because of one edge by six will give you the correct magnetic field. Okay. So, let us take a single wire having current I here and let us find the magnetic field because of this. Okay. Can you see this point, the center point is actually at the perpendicular bisector of this wire. Okay. If you join these two, you will see this as a equilateral triangle, this 60 degree and these two angles are 30 degree each. Okay. So, when you find magnetic field because of a straight wire at a perpendicular bisector, the magnetic fields formula is mu naught i times sin theta divided by 2 pi r, where r is the perpendicular distance between wire and the point. Okay. So, let us find magnetic field. First, I will write mu naught i divided by 2 pi sin theta. Actually, theta is this angle, either this angle or this angle because both are same. So, this angle is 30. So, I will have sin theta as 1 by 2 and r. R is actually the perpendicular distance between wire and the point. So, as this length is, as this length is 10 centimeter, all these lengths will be 10 centimeter because it is an equilateral triangle. So, this will be 10 centimeter and this perpendicular length would be 10 centimeter cos 30. Can you see that 10 centimeter cos 30 or 10 centimeter sin 60? Okay. So, let us consider it 10 centimeter cos 30. Okay. So, 10 centimeter in SI units is going to be 0 0.1 meters and cos 30 is root 3 divided by 2. These two got cancelled. Okay. As this is the magnetic field because of one wire, but it is a 50 turn coil. So, there will be 50 wires, 50 similar wires having current in rightward direction. That is why the magnetic field because of one side length, one complete side length would be this times multiplied by 50. Okay. And as there are six sides similar to AB having magnetic field in same direction, the net magnetic field would be equal to magnetic field because of one side multiplied by 6. Okay. So, this is your answer. As they are asking us the value in the units of mu naught by pi, I will reserve mu naught i by pi, mu naught i by pi and then can you see, I can write 50 multiplied by 6, I can write it as 2 times 3 and 3 as root 3 times root 3 divided by 2, 0 0.1 and root 3. So, 1 root 3 got cancelled, this 2 got cancelled, 0.1, 50 divided by 0.1 would be 500, 500 root 3 times mu naught i by pi. So, the correct answer would be 500 root 3 times of mu naught i by pi. So, mu naught i by pi is here. So, the correct answer is C. Okay. Okay. Over to the next question. Here in this question, they are asking us the magnetic field at this point O. And here we have a very long wire. Okay. Bringing current from almost infinity in this way. It is ending into a semicircular arc and then it is again in the shape of a 
लॉन्ग वायर कैरिंग करेंट टूवर्ड्स इन्फिनिटी सो इफ दिस इज द शेप ऑफ वायर वी हैव टू फाइंड करेंट एट दिस पॉइंट ओके द रेडियस ऑफ द सर्कुलर बेंड इज आर कैन यू सी दैट ओके I can divide this entire system into three parts. Okay, one is straight wire here, one is straight wire here, and one semi-circular arc here. Okay, if I try to find the direction of magnetic field because of this wire, see, because of this wire, current is towards right. We are trying to find magnetic field somewhere here, so I am pointing my fingers downward because current is like this. Okay, current is like this. and fingers downward towards center and if i curl my fingers the fingers are going inward so uh, because of this the magnetic field at this point is inward okay now i have this semi circular wire so in semi circular wire in circular arc i think you remember we have to curl our fingers in the direction of current like this we have to curl our fingers of right hand in the direction of current and now here the thumb points in the direction of magnetic field so again can you see the magnetic field because of semi circular wire is again inward inward yes and now we have a third part this again semi infinite wire carrying current this way towards left so again i if i point my thumb in the direction of current and point my fingers upward towards towards point o and i curl them the fingers are going inward so because of this wire to magnetic field is inward so can you see because of every part of the system the magnetic field is pointing inward so it is add it will be added like simple scalar okay so let me write the magnetic field because of this in, uh, wire and i think you remember because uh, magnetic field because of semi infinite wire is mu not i divided by 4 pi r okay as these two are identical semi infinite wire okay and they both have because of opposite current they they both have magnetic field in the same direction inward okay because of these two i can say the magnetic field would be this multiplied by 2 and if now i add magnetic field because of this circular arc because of circular arc magnetic field is mu not i divided by 2 into radius multiplied by alpha divided by 2 pi can you see the circular arc makes angle pi at the center so alpha is pi divided by 2 pi okay so pi got cancelled and this is the value of net magnetic field at center okay so let me take mu not i divided by 4 pi r common and inside the bracket we will have 2 and plus pi okay so if you check your options obviously the b is your correct choice okay over to next question no we don't have question right now we have a new uh, theoretical part and we this time we have to find we have to uh, learn the magnetic field because of a current carrying ring not at the center because at the center we know the magnetic field is mu not i by 2 times radius we have to find magnetic field at some point on the axis let us say this is the point p on the axis and what is the magnetic field here okay if the radius of the ring is r this distance this distance is x okay magnetic field again by taking a uh, small elements dl and integrating the result at point b we will be finding magnetic field at point p equals to mu not i the radius square divided by twice of the cube of this distance the cube of this distance r so if you already know r you can simply write r cube okay and 
in terms of r and x this can be written as mu naught i r square divided by 2 times using Pythagoras you can write r square plus x squares to the power 3 by 2. This is the value of magnetic field at point P. Now it is time to discuss the direction. Okay. This is very important part. Uh, see it clearly. The direction of magnetic field on the axis is again given by right hand rule. What we have to do? We have to just curl our fingers of right hand in the direction of current. Okay. So, if current is going this way, can you see that current is moving like this? I will turn my fingers like this and thumb is pointing towards me or towards right. You can, can you see that? So, thumb is pointing towards right. So, magnetic field even at the center is towards right and at this point also magnetic field is towards right and if you want to know the magnetic field on the axis at this point also it will be towards right okay so remember this point magnetic field may have different magnitudes at different points on axis but direction of magnetic field is same at every point on axis and it is given by the right hand rule okay if finger if current is like this the magnetic field will be in the direction of thumb okay so always remember this point okay obviously this magnetic field is highest when x is 0 can you see that magnetic field is highest when x is 0 where is x 0 obviously at this point so if you plot a graph of magnetic field versus distance x the magnetic field is highest at the center and then it drops and on the left also magnetic field has similar shape because magnetic field has same direction over all points of this axis okay so remember this formula and let's move now let us discuss the magnetic field by a straight wire a long straight wire and a circular ring a little more in detail okay Suppose in a straight wire the current is going upward and we wish to find magnetic field at a distance r from it. Okay. So, if this is the distance r, magnetic field at this point would be, let us check, current in the direction, thumb in the direction of current, fingers here and if I curl my fingers, the curl of fingers give direction of magnetic field and as the curl of fingers are coming towards outward coming towards you the magnetic field here would be outward similarly the magnetic field at a distance r on the right side will be inward okay so magnetic field at this point will be inward if i take a point at a distance r again outward like this outward outside the screen then i'll say the magnetic field is towards right and inward behind the screen it would be towards left okay so as at a distance r magnetic field is has constant magnitude and can you see the flow of magnetic field it is outward here rightward here inward here leftward behind so magnetic field lines are like concentric circles concentric circles magnetic field lines are circles with center on the wire okay with center on the wire okay as the magnetic field is large near the wire the magnetic field lines are very close to each other and as we move away the mag the gap between magnetic field lines increases as magnetic field magnitude drops away from the wire so always remember in case of a straight wire the magnetic field lines are concentric circles in the perpendicular plane of the wire and they have their center on the wire okay now let us look at magnetic field of a ring if we have magnetic field of, of a ring and the current is like this this time in case of ring i'll curl my fingers in the direction of current and thumb will give you the direction of magnetic field at the center so at center magnetic field is upward 
on entire axis magnetic field is like this. So, we see we can imagine a magnetic field line coming from center going towards infinity and making a very big loop of infinite radius and coming back on the center from here because magnetic field lines are always closed loops. Now, if we experimentally look at other locations, at other locations too, the magnetic field lines are like this. They are coming from the plane of the ring like this, making a big loop and coming back on the ring. Coming back towards the ring, coming back towards the ring. So, can you see in the plane of the ring, the magnetic field at every point is upward in the direction of magnetic field at the center and if I look in the plane of the ring outside the ring can you see as the direction of magnetic field is given by tangent of magnetic field line the tangent of magnetic field line suggests magnetic field is downward. So, always remember when we have a ring in the plane of the ring the magnetic field lines direction or magnetic field's direction is given by right hand rule and outside the ring the magnetic field is in opposite direction okay so this was the directions of magnetic field okay let's move for next law now we will learn ampere's law and ampere's law is another very beautiful tool for calculation of magnetic field but it will be used in certain cases in few symmetric cases only so, before understanding Ampere's law, let us understand its components one by one and then it will be easy for us to understand Ampere's law. The first term in Ampere's law is line integral of magnetic field. Okay. So, let us understand line integral of magnetic field. Suppose you have a region where magnetic field is present and these are magnetic field lines. Okay. In these magnetic field lines, suppose you take a path, an imaginary path from A to B and say you move from A to B in this direction. Okay. If you break this path into large number of small displacements, every displacement can be called DL and direction of DL will be from A to B. Okay, at the place of DL, there should be some electric field. At place of every DL, there should be some electric field. If I make dot product of magnetic field and DL at the place of magnetic field, like if we make dot product B dot DL, B and DL are corresponding means the B is magnetic field at the place of DL. Okay. And I calculate this B dot DL for every element and I sum this up or you can say integrate this up. This quantity is called line integral of magnetic field. Line integral of magnetic field. Okay. If this path is a closed curve, if this path is a closed curve, I will say the line integral of magnetic field over a closed path. Like suppose we have a path which is closed. Okay. Let us say the direction of DL is like this. We are moving. We are circulation. The circulation direction is clockwise or the DL is clockwise. So, I will take everywhere DL as clockwise. Here, the DL will be clockwise. Again, this path is in some magnetic field and at every DL, you do B dot DL. At every DL, you do B dot DL and if you add or integrate B dot DL, for all DL, for all elements of this path, no element left. Then it would be line integral of multi, uh, magnetic field over this closed loop. Line integral of magnetic field over this closed loop. But how these magnetic fields are created? These magnetic fields are created by electric currents. Okay, the magnetic field is created by electric currents. So, there should be some electric currents here in the region. Okay, 
so there may be few electric currents which may cross this loop and there may be few currents which may not cross this loop so actually the uh, law says the line integral of magnetic field over a closed loop this law is about closed loop the line integral of magnetic field over a closed loop is mu naught times is mu naught times the algebraic sum of current crossing that loop or we can say the algebraic sum of currents enclosed by the loop okay so actually suppose i have one current here let's say i1 and one current here let's say i2 i1 and i2 are infinitely long wire currents they are perpendicular to this screen and they are coming like this okay so actually the law says the line integral of magnetic field over a closed loop will depend upon the current that is crossing this, this loop so here the line integral will depend upon i1 only not on i2 not on i2 okay so the law says this will be equal to this b dot dl will be equal to mu not times mu not times the algebraic sum of current enclosed by the loop or crossing that loop i know the current is i1 the current i1 is crossing the this loop but should i place plus i1 or minus i1 that will be covered by that will be according to some convention okay so let us understand first that convention and now then we will come back to this point and we will decide whether i should write positive sign or negative sign for the current i1 okay so let us understand the convention suppose you have a loop loop may be of any shape okay and there is no convention for direction of dl you can take direction of dl as anti clockwise or you can take direction of dl as clockwise so if your circulation or direction of dl is anti clockwise you have to curl your fingers of right hand anti clockwise like this and then thumb the direction of thumb will give you right or positive direction of current okay so if you have taken dl as anti clockwise always remember if dl is anti clockwise outward current will be taken as positive and inward negative but if you take dl as clockwise positive see i have taken here clockwise positive okay so if i take clockwise positive the thumb is going inward and if thumb is going inward the inward current would be positive and outward current would be negative so let us see in the example in this example i have taken the direction of dl as clockwise so if direction of dl is clockwise i'll turn my i'll curl my fingers clockwise and see if i curl my fingers of right hand clockwise the inward direction would be positive so inward current would be taken as positive as i1 is coming outward so the i1 is negative so i should remove this positive sign here or uh, let me remove it like this yes and the i1 should be written as negative so always remember this convention for current okay this convention for current let us practice with a one more example okay suppose we have a loop like this okay we have a loop like this and there are two currents i1 and i2 obviously i1 and i2 are crossing this loop and i3 is not crossing the, this loop or i can say i3 is not enclosed by the loop i4 is not enclosed by the loop okay and we have to calculate we have to tell the value of line integral of magnetic field through this loop right through this loop okay direction of dl is arbitrary you can choose it clockwise or you choose it anti clockwise it is your choice but one thing if it is given in the problem then you have to take as it is given in the problem but if, if it is not given if direction of dl is not given you can choose it your way so suppose i choose direction of dl as clockwise this is the direction of dl like this clockwise if i take direction of dl as clockwise and i calculate integral b dot dl 
बी डॉट जी एल यस इंटीरियर बी डॉट डी एल सी द इनवर्ड करेंट वुड बी टेकन एस पॉजिटिव द इनवर्ड करेंट वो हु इज इनवर्ड करेंट आई टू इज इनवर्ड करेंट सो आई टू विल बी टेकन एस पॉजिटिव सो बी डॉट डी एल वुड बी म्यू नॉट टाइम्स आई टू एंड एज इनवर्ड करेंट इज पॉजिटिव आउटवर्ड करेंट वुड बी नेगेटिव सो आई वन शुड बी गेम एन एस अ नेगेटिव साइन एंड दिस बी डॉट डी एल अकॉर्डिंग टू एम पी एस लॉ डिपेंड्स अपॉन द करेंट क्रॉसिंग दिस लूप इट डज नॉट डिपेंड अपॉन द करेंट आई थ्री एंड आई फोर बिकॉज दे आर नॉट एनक्लोज बाय द लूप बट रिमेंबर द बी द बी हियर इज नेट मैग्नेटिक फील्ड बी एट एनी पॉइंट इज बिकॉज ऑफ एवरी करेंट विदर इन साइड और आउट साइड बी इज बिकॉज ऑफ एवरी करेंट बट द सर्कुलेशन और द लाइन इंटीरियर ऑफ मैग्नेटिक फील्ड डिपेंड्स अपॉन द करेंट एंड क्लोज बाय द लूप इट इज अ लिटिल सिमिलर टू द गॉस लॉ वी एव वी सेड दैट द फ्लक्स ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड थ्रू अ क्लोज सर्फेस डिपेंड्स अपॉन द एनक्लोज चार्ज ओनली बट द इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड एट एवरी पॉइंट ऑफ द गॉसियन सर्फेस इज बिकॉज ऑफ एवरी चार्ज every charge okay but it depend the flux depends upon the enclosed charge okay this closed loop is also called sometimes ampere loop so remember this point it is it can also be called as ampere loop as if we used to say gaussian surface to closed surfaces we used to uh use in gauss's law okay there is one very important point this law is not a universal law like gauss's law it has its limitations so when the currents crossing this loop are variable in time are varying with time the law will not hold true okay the law will not hold true it is valid only when the current are the currents are time independent okay so remember this point okay now let us understand few limitations few important points about ampere's law and then uh, we will learn ampere's law with some examples okay so the first point is the direction of dl will be according to direction of circulation along the tangent of the ampere loop so actually i told you the direction of dl is arbitrary you can take it clockwise you can take it anti clockwise but obviously the dl will be always along the tangent of the ampere loop yes it will be always along the tangent of the ampere loop the magnetic field calculated by ampere law is due to all the currents whether inside or outside the ampere loop i just told you about this the magnetic field when you calculate line integral of magnetic field is because of all currents but the line integral it depends upon the current enclosed by the loop only the net integral b dot dl that is line integral b dot dl over that closed loop depends only upon the currents inside the loop crossing it okay that's very simple point this is one very important point you should remember if you wish to calculate magnetic field in some cases obviously doing d dot dl can be very difficult so if you want to choose a good ampere loop okay a simple ampere loop always try such that the magnetic field and dl as you have to make dot product of b dot dl b and dl always try a kind of ampere loop where the angle between b and dl is either 0 90 or 180 because if it is 0 b dot dl will be simply b dl if it is 180 b dot dl would be b minus b b dl and if it is 90 b dot dl would be 0 so that will simplify your problem so always choose ampere loop wisely try to choose ampere loop such that the angle between magnetic field and dl is either 0 90 or 180 degree okay so we have a simple problem and it says find integral b dot dl over the given loop okay can you see the loop has few currents enclosed i1 i2 and i3 and few currents i4 and i5 are not enclosed okay so if we want to write closed integral b dot 
dl through this loop it will be equal to mu naught times now i have to write current obviously in this bracket the i1 i2 and i3 will appear but some currents are inside and some currents are outside so in this problem they have given us can you see this little arrow this arrow is arrow for circulation this arrow is direction of dl so if they are given us the direction of dl can you see the direction of dl is like circulation is anti clockwise and if circulation is anti clockwise the thumb is pointing outward and if thumb is pointing outward the outward current would be taken as positive the inward current will be taken as negative so i1 would be taken as positive i2 negative because it is inward and i3 positive and i4 and i5 all i4 and i5 this integral b dot dl will not depend upon okay so that is the answer this is your answer okay next it is again a very simple example and here we will calculate the magnetic field for a long wire long current carrying wire with the help of ampere law okay so suppose we have a long wire carrying current i can you see that and we wish to find magnetic field at a distance r okay so let us first look this wire from above and if you look this wire from above you won't be able to see the length of the wire you will be able to see only the cross section of the wire and you will see current coming towards you so from this observer's point of view the wire is nothing but a simple point the wire will would look like a simple point and the current would be towards you let us say the current is i i want to know the magnetic field at a distance r from it okay so at a distance r i'll draw a circle yes i'll draw a circle why circle because you know if i make a circle and i take suppose dl as anti clockwise i take dl as anti clockwise okay i am being a little clever here because i already know current is outward if current is outward obviously the anti clockwise circulation will give you positive results would give you positive direction of current so by looking at the direction of current i can cleverly uh, use the direction of dl like this so i won't have to write negative sign here okay as you know the magnetic field because of this current carrying wire is always tangential to circles so here the magnetic field would be like this here the magnetic field would be like this here the magnetic field would be like this so at every point of this path magnetic field is in different direction magnetic field is non uniform okay but can you see at this point dl is like this at this point dl is like this at this point dl is like this because dl is also tangential magnetic field is also tangential so at every point can you see dl and b have different directions every at every point but at every point b and dl are in same direction b and dl are in same direction so if i try to calculate close the integral b dot dl over this loop by symmetry of the problem i know the angle between b and dl is always zero the angle of b is variable the angle of dl is variable the directions are variable but at each point at every point b and dl are in same direction so if b and dl are in same direction angle between them is always zero i can write bit this b dot dl as b dl cos zero and cos zero is one so this will be written as Close integral b dl. That's it. Actually, this b vector was not constant because the direction of b is variable. But here we have magnitude b, 
and by symmetry you know there is no chance that magnitude of magnetic field at a distance r in this direction and at a distance r in this direction would be different. But the magnitude should be same because of the symmetry of the problem. So, I can take this magnitude outside this integration sign and this would be become b and closed integral dl. And if you add all dl, right, if you add all dl, you will simply get the circumferential length of the loop. So, it will become b times circumference which is 2 pi r, 2 pi r, okay. And now according to Ampere's law, you know the circulation or the integral line integral b dot dl is equal to mu naught times the current enclosed. So, here the current enclosed is i. As circulation is anti-clockwise, outward current would be taken as positive. This current is outward. So, I will say the current is plus i. And now you can calculate the magnitude of b as mu naught i divided by 2 pi r. I think the same result we derived or we wrote in the case of bar subvert law. Okay, and the same result we get in the, uh, with the help of Ampere's law. So, obviously, this is the very true result. Okay. Now, we will learn the magnetic field of thick wires or hollow wires, hollow long wire. So, here we have a long hollow current carrying cylinder, okay, like this. And the current is flowing on its surface. Current is flowing on its surface. Let the total current is I, okay. If you look at this wire from cross-sectional point of view, okay, so the cross-section of the wire would look like this, okay, and the current as it is hollow, so current will be on the surface only. So, current on the surface is distributed like this. The dots show the current is coming towards you means outside the screen, okay. The total current is I. But remember, if the current is distributed uniformly, if I is uniformly distributed over the circumference of cross section, obviously, because it is distributed on the circumference. So, it should be distributed uniformly. Then, according to Ampere's law, I am not deriving everything, but according to Ampere's law, what we see that if I take, if I see, if I check magnetic field at a distance r from the center, from the axis, at any point inside this hollow pipe, like A, at point A inside the hollow pipe, let us say the radius of hollow pipe is r. So, if the point A is inside the hollow pipe, you will say the R is less than capital R. And for R less than capital R means at inside points, let me write inside. Inside point of the hollow cylindrical tube, the magnetic field is 0. Always remember the magnetic field is 0, but only in the case of uniformly distributed current. Okay. And if we take a point outside, let us say B, outside R would be more than R, R would be more than R and the B will be given by mu naught I divided by 2 pi. Actually, if you analyze the result, you will notice that for outside points, I can consider all current, the total current is concentrated on axis. So, I should take for outside point, we should take as if the total current is concentrated on a thin wire on axis and then the magnetic field would be same as if we have a thin wire along axis having the total current I because it is mu naught I by 2 pi R. So, from center or axis to the surface, we have zero magnetic field. So, if we draw this magnetic field versus R, where R is the distance from axis, from axis 
up to the surface means inside point we have zero magnetic field okay we have zero magnetic field on the surface just outside it on the surface just outside it the radius the, the value of small r is very similar to capital r so we have the value of magnetic field just outside as mu not i divided by 2 pi capital r because there the distance from axis would be simply very uh, nearly equal to capital r okay and as we go away as we go away from the surface the formula suggests the magnetic field decreases because b is inversely proportional to r so b decreases like this okay so this is the variation of magnetic field in case you have a hollow pipe with current uniformly distributed on its surface right okay what if you again have a thick solid pipe okay the solid pipe and if you have a solid pipe the current may be distributed over its entire cross sectional area okay suppose if we look at the cross section of this pipe this is the cross section of this pipe and current is not just on the surface only it is distributed over the entire area yes current is everywhere over the area so if again current is distributed uniformly on area distribution is uniform over area you can write i divided by pi radius square pi r square that is cross section area this as i divided by area as the current density the current density right the current density and and now if we calculate and finally write the value of magnetic field just remember when you are inside means distance from axis is a small r and a small r is less than the radius of the pipe. The magnetic field, remember the magnetic field is given by mu naught by 2 j cross r. This is the value of magnetic field, okay, with direction. The, well, the direction of magnetic field would be along j cross r. What is J? J is current density vector and R is the radius vector. Okay. As the J is towards you, means perpendicular to this plane, R is in this plane, the angle between J and R would be 90 degree. So, magnitude would be equal to mu naught J R by 2 only. Okay. But in vector form, we have mu naught by 2 J cross R. Okay. If we go outside, outside for outside point like here for outside point when r is when r the distance from axis is more than capital r okay is more than capital r again you can consider the entire current i to be concentrated on its axis as if the entire current is flowing on a thin wire on axis and the current the magnetic field would be simply mu naught i divided by 2 pi r but this is valid for outside point and this is valid for inside point okay can you see at inside point the b is directly proportional to r so if b is directly proportional to r at the axis at the location of axis magnetic field is zero because r is zero here as you move away from the axis the magnetic field increases linearly because b is proportional to r for inside point so magnetic field increases linearly at the surface you get magnetic field as mu naught i divided by 2 pi capital r just outside it yes and as you move further away the magnetic field decreases like this because outside the pipe this formula is valid and this is inversely proportional to r okay so always remember one point in case of very thin wire, we used to think 
that magnetic field very close to where is infinity. We used to think or it is very large. But actually, if we take any practical wire, it will definitely have some thickness. It definitely has some radius. Okay. So, in case of practical wires, the magnetic field is zero on its axis. It increases from axis to surface. At surface, magnetic field is maximum and then it decays hyperbolically. Okay. As, as it is proportional to 1 over r. So, always remember this formula for inside and outside points. Okay. These are very, very important and many times they ask you questions about this. So, here we have in this question, we have a long straight wire of radius A carries a steady current I. So, the wire has a radius A. Let us say this is a wire and it is carrying a steady current I. The current is uniformly distributed over its cross section. So, it is like the second case. We do not have a hollow pipe. We have a solid pipe and the current is distributed over its cross section. Yes, the current is I. Okay. The ratio of magnetic field B and D dash at radial distances A by 2. So, B is at a distance A by 2 and B dash at a distance of 2A from the axis of the wire. So, B. As the radius of wire is A and you are at a distance A by 2 from the axis, this point will lie inside the pipe. At, at inside point, you have the B as mu naught by 2 J times R. What is J? J is actually the current density. Okay. So, as mu naught by 2, J will be given as the total current divided by area which is pi A square and r is the radial distance. So, radial distance is a by 2, a by 2. Let us calculate. We have mu naught i divided by 4 pi a. Please check. Okay. okay. This is b. But when we calculate b dash, okay, b dash is at a point 2a from the axis, 2a from the axis. So, this is an outside point and for outside point, the formula is different. I also told you for outside points, you can think of this entire current as if it is concentrated on its axis. Okay. You can take this pipe to be a thin wire on axis. Okay. And in that case, the magnetic field would be mu naught I upon 2 pi 2 pi times the distance. A distance is 2a. So, we have mu naught i by 4 pi a and it is same as b. Can you see that? It is same as b. So, uh, as they are asking us, the ratio of b and b dash, so the ratio would be equal to 1 and the correct answer is c. Okay. So, let us move further. Next question. Okay. In this question, they say we have a thick current carrying cable of radius r. Again, we have a thick current carrying cable of radius r. So, take the radius of cable as r. Okay. Carrying current i uniformly distributed over its cross section. So, current is distributed over its cross section. It is again similar to the second case. Second case. And they are asking us the variation of magnetic field due to the cable with the distance r from the axis. With the distance r from the axis. So, as you know, till the moment or till the point we are inside, we have magnetic field formula as mu naught by 2 j times r. B is proportional to r. So, up to a certain distance, up to distance r, b will be proportional to r. So, uh, this we can see in uh, B and C. Here we see B is proportional to R. Here we see B is proportional to R. But when we reach outside points, outside points, the magnetic field decreases as B equals mu naught I divided by 2 pi R. So, as we move away from the wire, outside it, magnetic field decreases. That is why this is wrong and this is correct relation. Okay, as we have discussed this in graph also. So, this is the correct relation. 
over to next question. Again, we have a similar kind of question. This time we have two long straight wires of cross section and they have different radii A and B. But having same current I, remember the currents are same, the radii are different A and B, okay. With A less than B, with A less than B, okay. Now they say, the magnitude of magnetic field B varies with radial distance R can be represented as. So, actually they are uh, representing the magnetic field because of both wires simultaneously. Okay. As you know, on the surface, the magnetic field is maximum. I think you remember this point. At the surface of wire, the magnetic field is maximum. And the value of maximum magnetic field is mu naught i by 4 pi. No, not 4 pi, 2 pi r, 2 pi r, yes. Yes, uh, magnetic field outside is mu naught i by 2 pi r. So, at the surface also we have magnetic field as mu naught i by 2 pi r and it is equal to the maximum mag magnitude of magnetic field. So, as the magnetic field depends upon, the maximum magnetic field depends upon i and inversely proportional to radius of the pi. Okay. So, as the current in the two wires are same, but the radius A is a smaller, the radius A is smaller, okay. That is why the magnetic field at the surface of the first is smaller radius pi will be more because magnetic field at the surface is actually mu naught i divided by 2 pi A. As A is a small, magnetic field at the surface of first pi will be small. So, obviously this shows A and B equal, it is not true. This graph shows B less than A, it is also not true. But this graph shows B more than A, this is the graph for A and this is the graph for B. It shows A less than B, that is true. This graph also shows A less than B, that is also true. But, but the maximum magnetic field in the case of A radius wire will be more. So, maximum magnetic field with the a radius wire will be more. So, this is the true option. The option C is correct. Okay. okay. Now, let us learn what are solenoids and toroids. They are just current carrying wire structures. Okay. So, suppose I have a long wire and I wrap it on uh, a, a cylindrical structure. I wrap that wire on some cylindrical structure. Suppose I take the cylinder and I wrap it a wire, a conducting wire on it like this. So, we get a shape, a helical or a spring like shape of wire and this shape is called a solenoid. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, these currents are shown incorrectly. So, suppose the currents are like this. In this end, current is going like this and from this current, current is leaving this solenoid. Okay. Let us say current is I. Okay. So, the direction of current in every turn will be like this. When we make this structure and suppose if the length of the solenoid L is very large as compared to the radius of the solenoid and number of turns 2 are very high. Number of turns number of turns very large. Please remember this point. If number of turns are very large, the length is very long as compared to the cross section, then we call it as an ideal solenoid. Okay, ideal solenoid. So, what is the condition for ideal? The length should be very long. Okay, and the number of turns should be very strong, very large. In that case, what we observe that the magnetic field inside the solenoid is very uniform. The magnetic field in the volume inside solenoid is very uniform and that magnetic field is given by this formula B equals to mu naught times small n i. Okay. And what is a small n? A small n is the number of turns per unit length of the solenoid. 
a small n, I can write a small n as number of turns per unit length of solenoid. And this is the formula for magnetic field inside a solenoid. Just remember this point. If we think of magnetic field outside the solenoid, it is too less as compared to magnetic field inside. So, approximately we assume magnetic field is zero outside. Okay. So, nearly we assume magnetic field is zero outside. So, B outside is nearly zero. And if someone asks you, what is the magnetic field at the end of the solenoid? At the end of the solenoid, what we see that inside the solenoid, entire the overall region, the fields are almost parallel, the field lines are parallel and they have equal gap between them. But when they come at the end, they slightly diverge and uh, after too many calculations, the magnetic field at end of the solenoid is found to be half of the magnetic field that we have inside the solenoid. So, just remember this point, magnetic field at the end of the solenoid is mu naught ni by 2. Okay. This is the formula for magnetic field at the end of the solenoid. Okay. What is a toroid then? Suppose you have a tire-like structure, you have a pipe-like structure, you have a tire-like structure and you wrap a wire closely on this, like this. So, this structure is called toroid, toroidal coil. Okay. This structure is called toroidal coil. We call, a tor uh, we call a toroid an ideal toroid again if number of turns are very large and this radius, the average radius of toroid R is very, very larger than the cross section of the toroid. Cross section of the toroid. And again, again we get the same formula. The magnetic field outside the toroid, the magnetic field outside the toroid is nearly zero. You can take it to be zero for all practical purposes. And magnetic field inside the toroid, inside toroid is given by mu naught n i. But remember, a small n represents number of turns per unit length of the toroid. Okay, per unit circumferential length of the toroid. Okay, you can call this a small n here as total number of turns divided by length. Total number of turns divided by length. And here the small n can be called as total number of length divided by this circumferential length. Okay, so uh, remember this formula for solenoid and toroid. Fortunately, we have same formula for both mu naught a small n i. Just remember, be outside, out of both the structures is almost zero. But at the end of solenoid, we have half the magnetic field as compared to inside volume. Okay. So, next, let us see this problem. This problem says a long solenoid. Long means the length is long. And if the length is long, obviously, you can say the it is an almost an ideal solenoid. So, if we have a long solenoid of 50 centimeter length, okay, for you 50 centimeter length is not uh, very long, but maybe the cross section is very small, maybe the cross section is very thin. So, obviously 50 centimeter length would be very long as compared to the cross section of the solenoid. So, a long solenoid having 50 centimeter length having 100 turns carries a current of 2.5 ampere. The magnetic field at the center of solenoid is, center is well inside solenoid and inside solenoid magnetic field is given by mu naught n i. Okay. We can write mu naught as 4 pi times 10 to the power minus 7 n. As 50 centimeter length has 100 turns. So, if 50 centimeter length has 100 turns, obviously one meter or 100 centimeter length will have 200 turns. So, I can say there are 200 turns per unit length. And if there are 200 turns per unit length, the value of a small n is 200. Remember this point. Okay. And the current, 
the current is 2.5 ampere so i can write 2.5 ampere okay and if you multiply this you will get uh, let us see what we get uh, 200 times 2.5 is 500 500 times 4 is 2000 so we have 2000 pi 10 to the power minus 7 or 2 pi times 10 to the power of minus 4 2 pi is nearly 6.28 so 6.28 times 10 to the power minus 4 tesla is the right answer okay so let's move so now we have another very important quantity a physical quantity related to this topic and that is magnetic moment what is a magnetic moment okay magnetic moment is similar to the dipole moment that you learned in case of electrostatics in the chapter of electrostatics okay but here we talk about magnetic moment so suppose you have a current carrying coil like this you have a current carrying coil Actually, the dotted portion represents the portion of the coil which is inside the screen and the solid portion represents the portion of the ring outside the screen. I have considered that this ring is actually in the perpendicular plane of this screen or board. We have half portion outside, we have half portion inside and we have current like this. We have current like this. Okay. If the current is I, okay, there are n turns in the coil and area of the coil is A, the magnetic moment of this coil is defined as NIA. Always remember, the magnetic moment of a current carrying coil is defined as number of turns times currents times area. Okay, but magnetic moment is a vector quantity. Okay, so uh, let me tell you how to decide the direction of magnetic moment and area vector and this is decided by right hand rule okay what you have to just do just curl your fingers in the direction of current right hand rule is very important in this in this chapter so curl your fingers in the direction of current and in the direction where your thumb points that will be direction of the area vector and that will be direction of magnetic moment. So, magnetic moment and area vector are in same direction. And they are given by right hand thumb rule. Always remember, you have to curl your fingers of right hand in the direction of current. And thumb gives you the direction of area and magnetic moment. So, in NIA, we have I as current, area A as area enclosed by the loop. We have N as number of currents. And direction of A and hence M is found using right hand thumb rule. Right hand thumb rule with fingers curling around the current loop. So, if fingers are curling around the current loop, we have A and M in the direction of thumb. Always remember this point. There are a few more uh, small topics. So, obviously very important. So, I am talking about concept of equivalent current. Equivalent to what? So, suppose you have a charge. Q and this charge Q is in uniform circular motion in a circle of radius R with say speed V with say speed V. So, you can always say a charge is in circular motion and if, it, if a charge is in circular motion you say if a charge flows it is equivalent to a current. So, as the shape of movement of charge is in circle this can be thought of as a current carrying loop this can be thought of a current carrying loop of same radius r of same radius r and this current will be called equivalent current of this charge if this current produces same magnetic field at center as it is producing at the center okay so, let me tell you how we decide equivalent current. Okay. As you know, the current is defined as delta Q by delta T. The charge flown 
per unit time. You can say if the time period of circulation of this charge is T, okay, you can say in every time period, in every one time period, the charge Q crosses any cross section of the ring. Okay, so you can say the charge crossing any cross section of the ring is Q in time capital T. Okay, so in, in time T, the charge passes is Q. So in unit time, the charge passing will be Q by T by unitary methods. So this is the equivalent current. So I can be written as I can be written as Q divided by the time period. This is an obvious answer. Yes. As I can be written as Q by T, you know 1 by T is also the frequency. So, you can also call I as Q times frequency. If you are given time period, use Q by T. If you are given frequency, use QF. You also know that frequency is angular frequency divided by 2 pi. Angular frequency divided by 2 pi. So, if in some problem you are given angular frequency, use equivalent current as Q omega upon 2 pi. Okay. And as angular velocity is V by R in this case, you can also use Q times V by R that is 2 pi R. Okay. So, any of the formula can be used. Which one you have to use? It depends upon the information we are given in the problem. Right. Okay. And now if they ask you, what is the magnetic field at the center. As you know, this is similar to a current. This system is similar to an equivalent current I equals to Q times F or Q times V by 2 pi R. You can call the magnetic field at center as mu naught I equivalent divided by 2 R as the magnetic field at the center of a circular coil is this. You have to replace I equivalent by any of this formula according to information in your problem. Okay. And one more important thing is modified by Oswald law. We have learned that the electric current carrying wires produce magnetic field. But how they produce magnetic field? Because the charges flow in electric uh, current carrying wire. So, actually every charge has magnetic field and when all charges magnetic field sum up, it becomes the magnetic field of that wire. So, what if we are given a single charge Q moving in some direction with velocity V, okay. We can also say that if the charge is moving, the current is moving in this direction. And if current is moving in this direction, this can be called as a small element of current. And at a position vector R from Q, the magnetic field at point P is given by modified by Sauvert law. So, actually the magnetic field at point P, because of this moving charge, is given by this formula. Just remember this. The magnetic field at point P is given by mu naught by 4 pi Q v cross r cap divided by r square or you can also call it as b at p equals to mu naught upon 4 pi q v cross r vector divided by r q just i is replaced by q and dl is replaced by Okay, DL is replaced by V. So, this gives you the value of magnetic field because of moving charges. Okay, obviously the direction of magnetic field can be found by using V cross R direction. So, as here for this point, V is in this direction, R is in this direction. If I turn my fingers of right hand from V to R, can you see V to R? The thumb is pointing inward and if thumb is pointing inward, obviously the magnetic field is inward. But in the case, Q is positive. If the charge is negative, put the sign of charge here and you will notice that magnetic field will be having a direction of 
minus v cross r. Okay, so minus v cross r says if the v cross r is pointing inward, the magnetic field should be pointing outward for negative charge. Always remember this point. Okay. Now let us understand the concept better by uh, solving few very important questions. Okay. So in this question, they say. Uh, the dipole moment of a current carrying loop having current I is M. So, suppose we have a current carrying loop. As they are saying a current carrying loop, they haven't said anything about the number of turns. So, I am assuming the number of turns as 1. So, we have a single turn coil having current I and the dipole moment is M. Obviously, M can be written as I times the area. Area would be pi into R square where R is the radius of the coil, right? Okay. Now, they say the magnetic field at the center of the loop is B1. So, obviously, the B1 is going to be mu naught I divided by 2 times the radius. Now, in the next line, the question says, when the dipole moment is doubled by keeping the current constant. So, can you see if current is constant, M is proportional to R square. So, R is proportional to, you can say, root M. So, if the dipole moment is doubled, the radius will be root 2 times. Okay. So, radius increases by root 2 times and now since the current is constant, the magnetic field at the center of loop is B2. So, I can say the B2 equals the same current constant current I divided by 2 and R, the new R is root 2 times old R that is root 2 R and they are asking what is B1 by B2. So, you divide these two equations and you will find B1 by B2 equals to root 2. Isn't this simple? And obviously the answer is A root 2. Okay. So, that was a very simple question. Let next, let's move to a next one. In this question, they say we have a three-dimensional loop. Okay. Uh, one part of the loop is in XY plane. Can you see that? And one part is in ZX plane. Right. This uh, loop carries a current I in it. Okay. I and the dimensions are A and B and this dimension is also A and this dimension as B. Okay. So, uh, they are asking us what is the magnitude and direction of magnetic moment of the loop? What is the uh, direction of magnitude and direction of magnetic moment of the loop? So, let us find the magnetic moment of this loop. As this loop is in two planes, okay, what we should do? We should just make some correction and let at the point where loop breaks, we make a small break here. Okay, just a small break here. Right. And let us draw two new lines like this. One this, one this. So, this one loop gets converted into two loops and if I assume the direction of current in this wire as this and in this wire as this, these two become two independent loops and every loop in a single plane. Okay. So, now I will write the magnetic moment of the, these two loops individually and the net magnetic moment will be given by the vector sum of these two magnetic moments. Assuming these two wires does not affect the situation because the effective current of these two wires is 0, one is carrying current in this direction and one is one is carrying current in opposite direction, obviously the same current I. Okay. So, let us first write the magnetic moment of this loop. Actually, the current is I and the area is A times B. So, magnetic moment would be A, B and I as current, right? Okay. And as this is an xy plane, the magnetic sh uh, moment should be in z direction. And if you turn your right hand fingers in the direction of current, you will see the magnetic moment is coming in z direction. So, I will multiply it by k cap and this is the magnetic moment of horizontal loop. Okay. Similarly, as the dimensions are same, current is same, magnetic moment of this vertical loop would be a be the area times current and as it is an exit plane. So, magnetic moment should be perpendicular to exit plane means along y direction and if I turn my fingers along current, the thumb points in positive y direction. So, this magnetic moment is in y direction. So, I am multiplying it by 
J cap, right? Okay. Now, the net magnetic moment of complete loop would be vector sum of these two. This is the magnetic moment. If you now want to find the magnitude of magnetic moment, simply square and add the two components. So, you will see A, B, I and times root 2 and this is the direction of magnetic moment, right? So, sorry, this is the magnitude of magnetic moment and we see in option A and option C, we have the same magnitude, right? But the direction, as you can see, the magnetic moment has direction along Z axis uh, and Y axis. So, if we want the direction of magnetic moment, we must find the unit vector along magnetic moment and unit vector along magnetic moment should be the magnetic moment divided by its magnitude. And if you divide this magnetic moment divided by uh, magnetic moment by magnetic moment, you will get j by root 2 plus k by root 2. So, this is the direction of magnetic moment and correct option is obviously C. Okay. Next question. Okay. Now, we have a theory and that says uh, the magnetic moment of a rotating charged body. So, if a rotating charged body, suppose we have a rotating charged body like this. Yes, we have a rotating charged body like this. It has some mass and it is rotating like this. Okay. So, obviously, its angular momentum should be, its angular momentum should be the moment of inertia about axis times omega. Okay. So, its angular momentum is along the direction of omega. This is its angular momentum. And as every charge is also rotating about the axis, every charge must contribute into magnetic moment. So, this body also has some magnetic moment associated with it. Okay. So, this also has some magnetic moment. Yes, this, this has some magnetic moment. But solution uh, or you can say calculation of magnetic moment involves a lot of integration. Okay. So, you can simplify this calculation by just learning or remembering one small formula that the ratio of magnetic moment and angular momentum is constant. The ratio of magnetic moment and angular momentum is constant if charge and mass are identically or similarly distributed. Remember, the ratio of magnetic moment and angular momentum is constant if charge and mass are identically distributed or uniformly distributed. Okay. So, always remember the uh, magnetic moment upon uh, angular momentum is Q by 2M, where Q is the charge on the body and M is the mass of the body. Okay. And this is valid when mass and charge are similarly distributed or uniformly distributed. When mass and charge have similar distributions. So, if you are given a question in where you want to find magnetic moment and you do not want to solve it by integration, just find its angular momentum. Angular momentum, finding angular momentum is easy because you know a lot about moment of inertia, you know a lot of theorems about moment of inertia and once you find angular momentum by multiplying angular momentum by simply Q by 2M, it gives you magnetic moment. Also remember, if charge is positive, if charge is positive, magnetic moment and angular momentum are in same direction. So, if this is a positive charge, angular momentum and magnetic moment will be in same direction. And by obvious reasons, if charge is negative, if mass is rotating in the same way, angular momentum will be same. But if charge is negative, obviously the current will flip its direction and magnetic moment will be opposite to angular momentum or in opposite direction, right? So, that is the uh, small thing, small funda. Please remember this and let us use it by solving or by calculating the mo angular momentum and magnetic momentum of this rod. So, here we have a rod, 
right we have a rod and it is rotating about this axis passing through end of the rod right and the axis is perpendicular to the rod the mass of rod is m the length is l and the charge is q and they are asking what is magnetic moment for the following rod okay see <coughs> magnetic moment of the following rod magnetic moment divided by angular momentum its ratio is constant so you can say magnetic moment is equal to q divided by 2m times angular momentum okay and do we know angular momentum angular momentum is simple angular momentum is simply i times omega factor what is i you all know that moment of inertia of this rod about the given axis is m l square divided by 3 times omega factor so angular momentum is ml square by 3 omega factor as omega factor is upward can you see we are curling our right hand fingers in the direction of omega and thumb is pointing upward so we have angular momentum in upward direction and as angular momentum is in upward direction the charge is positive so magnetic momentum will also be in upward direction and magnetic moment can be formed by replacing l vector here so we'll have q divided by 2m times ml square by 3 omega vector cancel this m and you have magnetic moment of this rod so any system's magnetic moment you can find by using this relation that m vector equals q by 2m l vector but the condition is mass and charge should be identically distributed right as the mass is uniformly distributed over the rod the length of the rod charge too should be distributed uniformly over the rod suppose the mass is more on left side the charge too should be equally more on the left side okay if this condition is followed you can easily use m equals to q by 2 m l vector okay now now we will start the next part of this chapter that is magnetic force on moving charge till now we have calculated magnetic field created by moving charge magnetic field created by the electric current now we will learn the magnetic force experienced by moving charge if placed in some other's magnetic field or current wire in some other's magnetic field okay so let me tell you the uh, basics if a charge let's say q is moving with velocity v in some certain direction and there exists a magnetic field suppose there exists a magnetic field b okay by lots of lots of observations and experiment people have found that this charge experiences a force okay in magnetic field and that force is given by that force is called magnetic force and this force is given by q times v cross b q times v cross b or the magnitude of forces magnitude of magnetic forces q v b sine theta where theta is the angle between velocity vector and magnetic field vector okay the direction can be found again by using the cross product rule and as you know the magnetic field is in the direction of v cross b if charge is positive so if charge is positive the direction of force will be from uh, in the direction of v cross b so let us solve what is v cross b let me uh, point our fingers towards first vector v and then let me turn these fingers from v to second vector b and can you see the thumb is pointing outward and if thumb is pointing outward the force on charge will be in outward direction and will be represented by a dot so the force the force vector is in the direction of v cross b right if some situation if in some situation you notice that if charge is negative the negative charge will bring a minus sign here and that minus sign will tell you the force on negative charge the magnetic force on negative charge will be in opposite direction of v cross b so if this would have been an electron the force should be pointing inward 
keeping the velocity and magnetic field same okay remember this point okay now there are some very important points let's learn them the force the magnetic force is perpendicular to both v and b so the important thing is the force is perpendicular to v if force is perpendicular to v you can say the force will be perpendicular to displacement every time because elementary displacements occur in the direction of velocity so force is perpendicular to displacement or let me tell you suppose we want to calculate the work done by magnetic force obviously the work done by magnetic force would be given by integral magnetic force dot dr okay as you know velocity is dr by dt remember velocity is dr by dt to dr we can write dr as fm vector and dr can be replaced by v dt v vector dt and since at every point of time this fm and v are always perpendicular they are always at 90 degree so their dot product will be always zero not only at certain instant it will always be zero and if dot product is always zero this sum will be always zero so actually the work done by this magnetic force is zero so remember the magnetic force like this q v cross b never works and if it never works and the charge is moving under this force only so because of absence of any work the kinetic energy and speed of the particle will remain same if a particle is moving only in magnetic field if particle of charge q if q is moving only in magnetic field b represents the magnetic field so if a charge q is moving only in magnetic field obviously the magnetic force would do no work work done by magnetic field or magnetic force would be zero and if work done is zero sorry if work done is zero if work done is zero the kinetic energy will remain conserved so the speed will remain same so this says kinetic energy and speed obviously the force will change the direction of velocity so velocity will change but the speed and that is magnitude of velocity will remain will remain same so remember this formula the force on charge in magnetic field is given by this but what if a charge is at rest if a charge is at rest velocity is zero and if velocity is zero the magnetic force is zero so magnetic field is perfectly blind for the charge particle if it is at rest right the next is lorentz force it is not very di different from what we learned actually it is a general expression of electromagnetic force means if a charge q let's say is moving with some velocity v and it is placed in electric field as well as magnetic field now it is in such a region that both electric fields and magnetic fields are present if this charge is positive it is going to experience force because of electric field and as it is moving it will experience a force because of yes force because of magnetic field too okay so obviously on charge q a force because of electric field will act in the direction of electric field if charge is positive and that force we can call as as electric component of the force and it can be written as the charge times electric field okay this is one force. and as it is moving in magnetic field a magnetic force a magnetic force component would also act on the particle and the other force would be f magnetic 
and that would be q v cross b the direction of this magnetic force would be along v cross b and as you know v cross b is outward in this situation so we have outward magnetic force and the net force net force on the charged particle is given by q e vector the electric component plus q v cross b vector the magnetic component and this net force is called lorentz force okay so it is called lorentz force and the two forces we learned in uh, previous chapters and in this chapter also they are simply two components of the main lorentz force that a charged particle a moving charged particle experiences in combined electric and magnetic field okay so this is the force okay some of you may say or uh, you may have a doubt that this force depends upon velocity and obviously the velocity is different in different reference frames so there arises a doubt that whether this force is frame dependent or a force whether it should be dependent upon frame as we have learned that the real forces never depend upon frame in every frame the force is same but according to formula this looks like the force is frame dependent because it is depending upon velocity okay so the answer to this question is actually this force too is independent of reference frames now i am moving a little outside the syllabus of 12th class okay just to tell you this very doubt that this force at first looks like it is it is frame dependent because it is depending upon velocity but you should remember this point it is not actually frame dependent but how let me tell you actually the charge as you know is not frame dependent it is independent in every frame but the electric field and magnetic field they are relativistic phenomena they are actually frame dependent so here we have uh, three factors which depends upon frame of reference the e the magnetic field and the velocity and they all three change in such a manner in different different reference frame that the force the net force the net lorentz force remains constant in every frame so just remember one point because the detailed discussion is outside the scope of 12th class okay but just remember one point that this force this force is not relativistic it is frame independent this force is frame independent so as we have learned that the magnetic field applies force on moving charge so obviously it will affect the motion of charge so let us understand case by case how the uh, motion of charge is affected by magnetic force and what are the possible cases of those motions okay so <coughs> let's discuss case 1 and in case 1 i have assumed that a charge is moving parallel to magnetic field that is velocity is parallel to magnetic field it will include two cases that is the angle between velocity and magnetic field is either zero or 180 degrees means either the velocity and magnetic field both are in same direction or both are in opposite direction so if a charge is moving parallelly or anti parallelly to a magnetic field the velocity or magnetic field are either parallel or they are in opposite directions exactly opposite directions the magnitude of magnetic force as it equals q v b sin theta and i think you remember the sin theta is zero for the values of theta as zero or 180 if theta is 180 degree sin zero is zero if if theta is zero degree 
sin theta is 0, if th theta is 180 degree, sin 180 degree is also 0. So, in this case, when velocity and magnetic field are at angle 0 degree or 180 degree with each other, the magnetic force is 0. And if magnetic force is 0 and there are no other forces acting on the charged particle, it will move undeflected without changing its velocity in the same straight line it was moving initially. Okay. So, the magnetic field will apply, apply no force on the charged particle in this case. The next case, the next case is if the velocity and magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, V is perpendicular to B. That is angle between V and B, angle theta equals 90 degree. Okay. So, suppose I am assuming a region there where the magnetic field is perpendicular to this screen and pointing inward. This magnetic field is represented by a cross. This is the magnetic field. Let me draw some more cross. So, these represent, these cross represents magnetic field line crossing this screen perpendicularly inward, right. Now, suppose we have placed a tiny positive charge Q having mass m and let us give a velocity v and the direction of velocity we can assume it as x axis. Okay. Now, as the charge is moving, a force will start acting on the particle, on the charged particle in the direction of v cross b. So, let us find the direction of v cross b. So, as v is towards right, let me put my fingers towards right and I should turn my fingers towards magnetic field. Magnetic field is inside. So, from V to B, if I turn my fingers of right hand, the force, the thumb is pointing up. So, the force is upward. And the value of force becomes, the value of magnetic force becomes Q, V, B and sin 90 and, and you know sin 90 is 1. So, force becomes Q V B. As this force is Q V B, the velocity has constant magnitude. Therefore, the force is also having constant magnitude. Why velocity has constant magnitude? Because you know the force never works. And if force does no work, the kinetic energy and the speed will remain same. So, as this force is always having constant magnitude and the force is always perpendicular to velocity, these conditions indicate that motion of charge would be uniform circular motion. As in uniform circular motion, you know the speed is constant. We have a speed constant here. In uniform circular motion, the force is perpendicular to velocity. We have force perpendicular to velocity. In uniform circular motion, as V is same, V is constant, magnitude of V is same. So, we have constant acceleration V square by R and constant magnitude of force uh, MV square by R. So, we have constant magnitude of force. So, all these three things suggest that motion of charge would be uniform circular motion. Here, motion will be uniform circular motion and required centripetal force will come from the centripetal force mv square by r will come from the magnetic force which is q v b right i can cancel one v from here and now you see the radius the radius becomes the radius of circular motion becomes mv divided by q times b. This is the formula for radius, right? Okay. As you all know, the force always points towards center. So, in the line of force, there must be center of circular motion. And if this is the circular motion center, this must be the radius mv upon qb. And if we have found the radius, the charge will move 
लाइक दिस इन सर्किल ऑफ रेडियस आर इफ मैग्नेटिक फील्ड इज प्रेजेंट एवरीवेयर राइट एंड दिस इज द रेडियस ऑफ द सर्कुलर पोर्शन we can remember few more formula about radius as mv is linear momentum let us write mv as momentum divided by qb p represents momentum here so always remember r is momentum upon qb as you know the as you know the kinetic energy in terms of momentum is given by momentum is square divided by 2m right okay so p square can be written as 2mk so here i can write p as square root of 2 m kinetic energy divided by qb so these are the few variations of the formula and you may require them in different questions okay okay can you see r is depending upon velocity so if the charge is moving with bigger velocity it will travel a bigger radius circle it will travel a bigger circle of bigger radius and by v by r let us separate v by r you know v by r is angular velocity okay in uniform circular motion obviously v by r is uniform angular velocity and angular velocity will be given as just bring this r here and qb by m on the right hand left hand side you will have omega as qb divided by m okay so angular velocity of the particle is qb by m as you know omega is given by 2 pi times frequency the frequency will be given by 1 upon 2 pi qb by m and as frequency is reciprocal of time period right so time period will be given by 1 upon frequency that is 2 pi m upon qb so notice this fact that the radius depends upon velocity but the time period is independent of velocity it depends only on mass of the particle and the charge of the particle and obviously the magnetic field so if time period is independent of velocity if you throw many particles many identical particles with different speeds they will travel circles of different radii but they will all complete their circular motion at same time because time is not depending upon speed okay so try remembering this formula and uh, this is a very important formula and you will see many problems based upon this so let us solve few problems here we are given that force is q times v cross b that that we already know the b can be written, written as in components as bx by b by j b z k the charge is 1 uh, let's say 1 coulomb velocity is given to you and the force is given to you and they are asking us what will be the complete expression for magnetic field okay okay so let us write force as q v cross p okay q is 1 let's forget q and v is 2i plus 4j plus 6k 2i plus 4j plus 6k and let's write b as bxi plus byj plus bzk and let's cross product let's make a cross product as i cross i is zero you when we multiply 2i by bxi the i cross i will be zero now let us multiply i by byj you will have 2 by and i think you remember i cross j is k right now i'll multiply 2i with bzk so i'll write 2 bz and i cross k is minus j so it is minus j okay that is the first two term now i'll uh, multiply the 4j by all these three components so 4j with bxi you will have 4 bx and as j cross i is minus k so i'll write minus k okay 
Now 4j cross b by j, j cross j is 0. So I'll write 0 there. And then 4j multiply with b z k, you know j cross k is i. So I'll have plus 4 b z i because j cross k is i. Okay. Now we have 6k left. So 6k with b x i will be having plus k cross i, k cross i is j, k cross i is j. So we'll have 6 b x j and then k cross j, k cross j is minus i. So I'll be having minus 6 b y i and then k cross k is 0. So that is 0. And this is the value of force. And the value of force we are already given as 4i minus 20j plus 12k. 4i minus 20j plus 12k. Let us compare the terms. Okay. Let us, let us compare the coefficient of i. And we have coefficient of i as 4bz minus 6by. 4 bz minus 6 by and it is equal to 4 because coefficient of i are same so it is equal to 4. Let us now compare coefficient of j. So coefficient of j we have coefficient of j as minus 2 bz plus 6 bx and here we have 20. So you can say 2 bz Two B Z minus we have two uh, B Z plus six B X, so it will be six B X equals to twenty. I have multiplied this equation by a minus sign, and now comparing the coefficient of k, you have two B Y minus four B X here, and equals to twelve. Now, if you try to solve these three equations, you will end up only at two identical equations and uh, the equations cannot be solved to get all three components. So, let me write this equation as b y equals to, let us divide it by 2 and put this minus term on the right hand side. So, I will have 6 plus 2 b x, it is x actually, yes b y equals to 6 plus 2 b x. Okay. If this is the equation, let us check. If I put b x as minus 8, I will get 6 minus 16 as minus 10, but b y is not minus 10. So, this option is wrong. You can do this by any equation. I am doing it by third equation. If I put 6 equals to, oh, sorry, uh, if I put bx equals to minus 6, we will have minus 6 multiplied by 2 minus 12, 6 minus 12 minus 6. So, this is maybe correct. Okay. Let, if you check these two, you will say, obviously, these both you will find wrong. So, correct option is b only. Okay. So, sometimes we have to try a little hit and trial also as in this question. So, over to next question. Here we have a current carrying long wire. Okay, this wire is long actually and it has a current of 5 ampere going towards right and at a 20 centimeter distance from it, we have an electron moving towards right with a speed of 10 to the power 5 meter per second. And we have to tell them the magnitude of force experienced by the electron at this instant. Okay. As the electron is here, here there will be a magnetic field produced by this current carrying wire. And what magnetic field here the current carrying wire will create? That magnetic field should be B equals to mu naught I by 2 pi R. So, mu naught I upon 2 pi R, where R is 20 centimeter. Okay. This magnetic field at the place of electron will be outward, right? The same right hand rule. So, magnetic field is outward. 
and if magnetic field is outward you do v cross b let's uh, let's calculate v cross b so v is towards right right v is towards right and b is outward so v cross b is inward so the force is like this and the magnitude of force is given by the force is given by q v b sin theta q v b sin theta let let's put the values q as 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19 the velocity is 10 to the power 5 the b is this so mu naught by 2 pi is actually 2 times 10 to the power minus 7 i is 5 ampere so i is 5 ampere and divided by 2 pi r 2 pi we have included in uh, this uh, factor r is 20 centimeter so 0 0.2 and solve this and you will find the magnitude equal to 8 times 10 to the power minus 20 so d is the correct answer okay over to next question here we have a proton proton means as charges of electron mass is a little heavier the mass is given i think okay the mass is actually 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 27 i think you remember it and the proton is projected with some velocity that is 2 i cap in a region where magnetic field is also present and electric field is also present and we have to find out the net acceleration of proton so let us find first the net uh, force on proton as the uh, proton is moving in both electric and magnetic field the two component act on it and the net force is given by the net force is given by q v cross b plus q times electric field okay q let's put q and let's take common v cross b i'll do v cross b v is this and b is this okay Okay, so V cross B, we will have to multiply 2i with i and as you know i cross i is 0, so we can ignore it. Next we have 2i multiplied by 3j, so 2i multiplied by 3j, we have 6i cross j, i cross j is k and then let us multiply 2i with 4k, so we have 2 multiplied by 4 as 8 and i cross k as minus j, so this is the value and it is micro tesla so i can put 10 to the power minus 6 here okay then i have electric field plus q times electric field what is electric field electric field is 10 i cap micro volt per meter so we have 10 to the power minus 5 i cap okay and this is the value of f net let us take q common and uh, the acceleration will be given by obviously the force divided by mass so let us take q common okay and also let us take 10 to the power minus 6 common and you will see 10 i minus 8 j and plus 6 k in the bracket and let us divide this by divide this by the mass of proton which is 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 90 minus 27 kilogram okay so this is the expression you solve it and when you put the value of q as 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19 you will get answer as 1400 meter per second square okay so a is the right answer now it is time for next question here we are again given an electron is moving in circular path under the influence of a transverse magnetic field transverse magnetic field means the magnetic field is perpendicular to the path okay if the value of e by m is given the frequency of revolution of electron will be so as we already know the frequency of revolution of electron uh, when charge moves in circular path in magnetic field is 1 upon 2 pi and qb by m qb by m we know the electrons charge qb by m 
we know the magnetic field is this much okay okay we can put the value of magnetic field and we also know the mass of electron as nearly 9.1 times 10 to the power minus 31 so you put all the values here and you will get a value very close to 1 gigahertz okay so that is the simple question over to next question now here we have two ions ions means the two molecules uh, they lost or gain some of the their electrons so two ions having same mass and charge in the ratio 1 is to 2 so they have same mass but charges are in the ratio 1 is to 2 they are projected normally in uniform magnetic field do you remember when we throw a charge normally with magnetic field it goes in a circle okay and their speed ratio is 2 by 3 they are asking us the ratio of their radii of circular trajectories. We can simply apply the radius as mv divided by qb. As they are thrown in same magnetic field, magnetic field is same for both, mass is same for both, for both, velocity is different, charge is different. And obviously, we can write r1 by r2 as, as v is in numerator. The R depends directly on V. I can write R1 by R2 as V1 by V2. And as it depends inversely on charge, I can write R1 by R2 as depending upon Q2 by Q. Okay. So, as V1 by V2 is given as 2 by 3 and Q2 by Q1 as 2, we have 2 by 3 multiplied by 2. And answer is 4 by 3. So, B is the perfect answer. Okay, let's move. Next, next they give us an electron gun placed inside a long solenoid, okay. And the electron gun throws a electron and they say the solenoid uh, has n turns per unit length, carries a current I. From this data, we can find magnetic field obviously in the solenoid. The electron now sh uh, gun shoots an electron along the radius of the solenoid obviously from center with some speed v and what we have to do we have to find the maximum possible value of v such that electron does not collide with the wall of solenoid ok. So, let us understand the problem well we have a cross section of solenoid suppose we have a cross section of solenoid the current is flowing like this and inside the solenoid you know the magnetic field is uniform and b is given by mu naught n times i ok as they are shooting an electron from center with velocity v and v is perpendicular to b because b is along the axis and v is in the plane of cross section so this electron will experience a force that is q v cross b can you see v cross b is towards left but electrons charge is negative so it will experience a force here and because of this force, it will go in a circle like this. But if we want this electron not to touch the surface of the solenoid, obviously this circle, the diameter of this circle should be smaller than the radius of solenoid. Okay, Diameter of the circle should be smaller than dia of circular path must be smaller than radius of solenoid okay as you know the dia of circular path is two times radius of circular path and radius of circular path is mv divided by qb the charge on electron is e times b is less than radius of solenoid let us see what is the radius of solenoid and radius of solenoid is capital r so it must be less than capital r so this equation says the v should be less than e b r divided by 2 m and if it should uh, 2 m so if v has to be less than this value this value is actually the maximum value of speed and let us see where we have e b r by 2 m so here we have e this is b remember b is mu naught n i so e b r by 2 m we have an option a because that's why option a is the right choice okay over to next question Okay, now we have an electron 
moving along x direction with a velocity of 6 times 6 to uh, 10 to the power 6 meter per second and it enters a region of uniform electric field pointing along positive y direction and there is also a magnetic field set up in the region such that electron keeps moving along the x direction. Okay. Let us draw the situation. We have x axis, let us say this is the y axis and the z axis is outward. Let me draw it this way, z axis, but try to assume z as outward. As the electron's velocity is towards right, V is towards right and electric field is in the positive y direction. As charge of electron is negative, a force on electron acts, an electric force acts in negative y direction which is equal to E times E. Now they say the charge moves undeflected and it keeps moving along x axis. It is only possible when this electric force is balanced by magnetic force and where is magnetic force? Magnetic force is, mag magnetic force should act along positive direction of y axis as magnetic force is E V B sin theta, it must act along positive x axis, okay. As you uh, see the options, the, the magnetic field is either along negative z direction or along positive z direction, okay. So, let me check only two cases, z direction and negative z direction. Let us say the magnetic force, magnetic field is along positive z direction. If magnetic field is along positive z direction, see z direction is towards outside, V cross B will point downward. V cross B will point downward and if V cross B is downward, the charge is negative, the magnetic force must act in the positive y direction. So, this is the correct choice. If you take magnetic field direction as negative z axis, negative z direction, the force would be pointing downward and if two forces are downward, the electron will definitely deflect from it direction. Okay. So, we have correct choice as positive z direction. So, either C or B must be correct. Okay. If electron has to move with constant velocity, this force E, V, B, sin theta, must balance E times electric field. Let us cancel E and uh, let us see what is B. The B is actually E divided by V and sin theta. Can uh, I think you know that angle between V and B is 90 degree. So, sin 90 will be 1. So, we can ignore sin theta and let us calculate B by simply dividing V uh, from electric field. Okay. And if you solve this, electric field is 300 volt per centimeter. If in 1 centimeter you have 300 volt, in 1 meter you will have 300 times 100 volts. So, electric field is 3 times 10 to the power 4 and velocity is 6 times 10 to the power 6. So, we have magnetic field as you solve it and you will get 5 times 10 to the power minus 3, not this. So, C is the correct choice. Okay. Next question. This time we have a particle of charge Q and mass m and moving with the velocity minus V i cap means the particle of charge Q mass m is moving towards negative x direction with the velocity y. And it is moving towards a large screen placed in y z plane. So, let us uh, put a screen here and this is y z plane, y z plane. Okay. If there is a magnetic field, okay, and magnetic field is along uh, positive z direction, so let us assume positive z direction is outward, so we have a magnetic field B naught here, okay. As there is a magnetic field, magnetic force will act on it and magnetic force on positive charge acts along V cross B. So let me do V cross B. If I do V cross B. The direction of force is upward and direction of force is upward and obviously this uh, charge will go in circular motion. So, this charge will go in circular motion like this. 
they are asking is the maximum value of v for which particle will not hit the screen and this is very visible from the situation that if this distance d is bigger than the radius of circular path the particle will go in a circular path without hitting the screen so the condition is r should be smaller than d r should be smaller than d let's put the value of r as mv divided by q b not less than d we will have b oh, sorry we will have v should be less than q b not d divided by m so obviously the maximum value of velocity is q b not d by m so we have q b not d by m in the option a so a is your rightest choice next question in this question they say in an experiment electrons are accelerated from rest by applying a voltage of 500 volt Calculate the radius of path if magnetic field is then applied. Charge on electron is given, mass of electron is given. C. If electron has a charge E and they are accelerated by a potential of 500 volt, obviously there will be some work done on the electron and that work done will be charge times potential difference E times V. Okay. Charge times V. By capital V, we will be meaning voltage here in this question. Okay. If this is the work done on electron by work energy theorem, do you know the work is converted into kinetic energy that is half m a small v square. Remember the capital V is voltage and a small v is velocity. Okay, so now we know what is kinetic energy. I can say this Ev is equal to actually kinetic energy. And as we remember, the radius of circular path is mv by qb. Mv is momentum and momentum can be written as square root of 2 mass times k divided by qb, q is e and b. Put the value of k as ev, you will have radius as root 2 m e v by e b. Cancel root 2 e from numerator and denominator and you will have radius as 1 upon b, let us take it outside and you will have 2 m v divided by e. You are given the mass of electron, you are given the charge on electron, you are given the voltage as 500 volt, just put the value here. You solve it very carefully uh, and you will find the correct answer as 7.5 times 10 to the power minus 4. So, correct answer is d. Okay. Over to next question. Here they are asking that when a proton and an alpha particle, uh, I think you very well know the ratio of mass and charges of alpha and proton, but they have given you the masses in the ratio of 1 is to 4 and charge in the ratio of 1 is to 2 are accelerated from rest through a potential difference V and if a uniform magnetic field is set up perpendicular to their velocity. If magnetic field is perpendicular to velocity, the, the particle path is going to be circle. What is the ratio of radii of a proton to radii of alpha particle that we have to find? Okay. So, as the radius is equal to mv divided by qb, mv can be written as square root of 2m times kinetic energy and when a charge Q is accelerated by a potential difference V, the work on it will be Q times V and kinetic energy will obviously be Q times V if it is accelerated from rest and then QB. Let us cancel root Q from numerator and denominator and you will find R as 1 upon B times the square root of 2M V divided by Okay, as V is same, as V is same for the two, you can write R proton divided by R alpha as a square root of M proton by M alpha as M is in the numerator and Q alpha by Q 
proton as q is in denominator okay let us put m proton by m alpha as 1 by 4 as they are saying it is 1 by 4 and q proton by q alpha is 1 by 2 so q alpha by q proton is 2 and we will have 1 by root 2 as an answer so correct choice is d let us solve one more question based on this this question is again similar to the two questions i solved it earlier and here we have a charged particle having charge of 1 micro coulomb and moving with some velocity given here and the charge is moving in some external magnetic field given here and they are asking us what is the force on that charged particle. So force on any charge in magnetic field is given by Q V velocity cross V. Let us multiply all three. We have Q as 10 to the power minus 6 because 1 micro coulomb. We have velocity as 2i plus 3j plus 4k cross b as 5i plus 3j minus 6k times 10 to the power minus 3. You multiply them by basic method of multiplying first i, first this term with all three terms this term with all three terms and this term and all with all three terms and adding them or by method of discriminant okay you can solve it anytime and finally you will get minus 30i plus 32j minus 9k times 10 to the power minus 9 okay so that will be in newtons so as they are saying the force is f times 10 to the power 9 so you can see the value of f is going to be this and this is in option c so option c is your correct choice okay now this is it is time for next question again in this question they have said a electron an electron a proton and alpha particle having the same kinetic energy are moving in circular orbits in a uniform magnetic field what will be relation between their radii okay as they as they have same kinetic energy you know in terms of kinetic energy radius is the square root of 2 m square root of 2 m k divided by the charge and magnetic field as the masses are different as the charges are different but kinetic energy is same b is same so we can say the r the radius is proportional to a square root of m divided by q now let us compare the radius of proton and alpha particle okay as the mass of proton and mass of alpha particle are in the ratio of 1 is to 4 okay so let us compare the radius of proton upon radius of alpha particle and it will be under root of mass of proton divided by mass of alpha particle multiplied by as q is in denominator we will have q alpha by q proton okay let's write it again rp by r alpha equals mass of proton is 1 upon 4 times of mass of alpha so this will have 1 by 4 times charge of alpha is twice of charge of proton so we'll have 2 here and this will be 1 so that says protons radius and alpha particles radius will have same value okay so here we have same value here we have same value here we have same value now let us think of radius of electron as electrons charge is same as protons charge so if you compare the radius of proton and electron by charge there will be no difference but the mass of electron is way smaller than mass of proton so the radius of electron will be very smaller than mass of proton i think you remember 
the mass of electron is almost 2000 times smaller than mass of proton. So, the radius will be square root of 2000 times smaller than radius of proton. So, obviously, the radius of electron is much less than this value. So, correct answer is D. In this question, as you know already that a charge moving in a circle can be considered as a current. So, in the first line they are saying uh, the same thing and uh, then they say a particle of mass m carrying a charge q is moving in a plane with uh, a speed v under the influence of a magnetic field b. So, if in a, in a magnetic field a charge is undergoing a circular motion, one thing is very clear that the velocity must be perpendicular to magnetic field. So, let us take this is magnetic field and this is charge q and it is moving like this, the velocity is like this and if velocity is like this, this the force will be q v b okay, in the direction of v cross v and v cross b is pointing upward. So, this is the force. And in this force particle will move like this. So, the direction of current or you can say the sense of circulation of current is anti-clockwise, right? Okay. Let me write the radius. As you know, the radius is mv divided by qb. Okay. And the current associated with the circulating charge is equal to charge times frequency. And uh, that, that can also be written as v divided by 2 pi r as 2 pi r by v is time period and uh, inverse of time period is frequency. So, this is the current. Okay. As they are asking us the magnetic moment. So, I think you remember magnetic moment is given by number of turns times i times area. As this is a single charge revolving in a circle, I will take one turn. It is equivalent to a one turn coil. The current is i and area. Let us multiply them uh, as the current is q times v divided by 2 pi r and area is pi r square pi r square. I can cancel this pi, I can cancel 1 r and we will left with will be left with q v r by 2. So, we have magnetic moment as q v r by 2. Okay. Magnetic moment as q v r by 2. Let us put r as m v divided by q b. So, this q also got cancelled and we now know the magnitude of magnetic moment as m v square by 2 b. Now, as you can see in the options, they are they have written the options in vector form Okay, uh, in terms of magnetic field vector. So, we have assumed the magnetic field is inward and just try to uh, test the direction of magnetic moment. As the charge is going anti-clockwise, let us turn our fingers anti-clockwise and the thumb is pointing upward, outward means in the direction opposite to magnetic field. Okay. So, now we know the magnetic field is in the opposite direction of magnetic field. So, to give it some direction we can multiply it by a negative of unit vector of magnetic field. Okay. This will give it direction and now it becomes mv square b vector divided by no it is mv square b vector divided by 2b square with a minus sign and if we check the options okay, mv square b vector by 2b square minus with a minus sign. So, C is the right answer. Okay. Here in this question again they are saying a particle having same charge as, a, as that of uh, electron moves in circular path in magnetic field. Okay. The radius is given, the magnetic field is given. So, if particle is moving in circular path, it means velocity is perpendicular to magnetic field. Means if say velocity is like this, the charged particle is like this, magnetic field let us take is inward and velocity and magnetic field are in opposite direction okay sorry in perpendicular direction and in this direction the magnetic force is acting and it is making a circular motion of radius 0.5 centimeter i can write the radius as the mass of the particle the speed divided by the charge times magnetic field 
Now they are saying that if an electric field of 100 volt per meter makes it to move in a straight path, then what is the mass of the particle? Okay. So, what happens when we apply an electric field and what happens is that the particle is, goes along a straight path? The answer is simple. If the particle is going along a straight path, it means the magnetic force is being balanced by electrical forces. So, electrical forces must act in this direction, opposite to magnetic force Fm and these two must cancel. If these two get cancelled, the particle will now go in a straight path along the direction of velocity. So, what we can write is the magnetic force which is Q V B in magnitude, this must be equal to charge times the electric field. Okay. So, Q got cancelled. Yes. And we have to know the mass of the particle. Okay. So, here, as we know the radius, okay, the velocity can be replaced by velocity here and uh, we know the value of magnetic field. The V can be written as R Q B divided by M, okay. We have, we have replaced by R Q B divided by M multiplied by B equals to electric field. So, from here you see, can you see the Mass is equals to R Q B square divided by electric field. We are given the value of R as uh, 0.5 centimeter. The value of charge is electrons charge that is 1.6 10 to the power minus 9, 19 coulomb. The value of magnetic field is simply 0.5 Tesla and the electric field is 100 volt. Put all these values and you will get the D as an answer. Okay. So, that is the mass of the particle. Okay. Okay. Now, we have considered, since we have considered two cases of motion of charge, one when velocity is parallel or anti-parallel to magnetic field and one when velocity is perpendicular to magnetic field. When velocity is parallel or anti-parallel with magnetic field, magnetic field just ignores charge, it does not apply any field as Q V cross B is 0. Okay. And when magnetic field is perpendicular to velocity, the charge moves in a circle. But what if, what if velocity is at some angle with magnetic field? So, now it is time to take the third case when the mass of particle is m, let us say charge is q and this particle is thrown at some angle with magnetic field. Okay. So, this charge is thrown with velocity v let us say and velocity makes angle theta with magnetic field. Okay. So, what we can do and what we should do in every case, every such case, we should make two components of velocity, we, we should break two components of velocity, one along the magnetic field let us call it V parallel. Obviously, V parallel is V cos theta and V perpendicular as V sin theta. Why we have made two components of velocity? Before, because doing so, we get two cases or two velocities whose cases we have studied. We have studied case when velocity is parallel to magnetic field. So, one velocity is parallel to magnetic field and its case we have studied few hours back, few minutes back. And one velocity is perpendicular to magnetic field and you know what happens when velocity of charged particle is perpendicular to magnetic field. So, let us superimpose those two cases together in this case. Try to imagine the particle has only one velocity component V parallel. What will happen? If the particle has only one velocity v parallel and particle is moving in this direction, what will happen then? The particle will move with constant velocity because no force acts on it. The magnetic field does not apply any force on the particle moving along magnetic field as magnetic force is 0. So, because of this velocity, the motion of charge will be uniform straight line motion with constant velocity along magnetic field. Okay. So, because of this, the charge will continue moving without 
any change in velocity. And what happens when the charge has only this velocity? If charge has velocity perpendicular to magnetic field, the charge experiences a force perpendicular to velocity and magnetic field and that force causes circular motion of charge. Okay. So, here if we have only this velocity v, v perpendicular, the charge will experience a force inward inside the board. So, the center of circular motion will be inside the board okay. and the charge will take a circular motion like this. Okay, because whenever velocity is perpendicular to magnetic field, the charge makes a circle. Okay, so here we have two cases. Here we have two motions, and two motions will superimpose. Just try to imagine when particle has only this velocity, the particle used to run with constant velocity, and when particle has only this velocity, the particle turns in a circle like this. Okay, but what if the particle has these two velocities, the two motions get superimposed. Because of this, particle moves in a circle like this also and because of this, particle moves in this direction also. So, what particle actually does? The particle keeps on moving in this direction uh, along with doing circular motion. So, particle keeps moving in circular motion and also moves along magnetic field with constant velocity. So, the motion of particle becomes like this. The motion of particle is a helical motion. It has two motions superimposed. One motion is circular because of this velocity and one motion is linear because of this parallel velocity. Okay. This spring-like motion is called helical motion. Helical motion. So, you must remember if angle between velocity and magnetic field is not equal to 0, 180 or 90 because those all we have studied. It is not equal to 0, 180 or 90. It is some other angle. Then we can uh, take two components of velocity, one parallel to magnetic field and one perpendicular to magnetic field. The perpendicular component makes the particle move in circular motion and the parallel component makes particle to move in a straight line motion and when the, these two superimpose, particle goes in a circular motion and also goes in a straight line motion. So, its circular path moves along the direction of V parallel and we get this helical motion or helix kind of motion. Okay. So, always remember if angle between velocity and magnetic field is not 0, 180 or 90, it is just some angle theta, the motion of particle is helical motion. Okay. If you see this helix from this side, you won't be able to see the linear motion. You will just see the cross section of this helix and the cross section of this helix is like this. Remember the circular motion was because of V perpendicular, we have magnetic field inside, we are looking at this figure, the picture like this along the magnetic field. So, the charged particle goes in a circle like this and uh, the radius of this circle is obviously given by mv perpendicular divided by qb. Why perpendicular? Because V perpendicular is the velocity because of which the particle goes in a circle. Obviously, the time period is going to be 2 pi m by qb. The time period has no impact of velocity. The time period is independent of velocity. That is why time period of circular motion is still the same. Okay. And Obviously, in one time period, obviously, in one time period, the particle makes one complete turn. The particle makes one complete turn. But in one complete turn, suppose the particle is sometimes here and in one time period, it will make one full turn. So, particle will be here. So, the distance traveled by particle along V parallel, the distance, listen carefully, 
the distance traveled by a particle along magnetic field or along V parallel in one time period is called pitch. Pitch. And obviously, pitch P is given by because this distance is traveled by V parallel and it is a distance traveled by in one time period and as V parallel is constant, we can say this pitch is equal to V parallel times time period or simply V cos theta times time period as 2 pi m by qb. Okay, so these are three important parameters. Okay, the radius of uh, cross section of helix is mv perpendicular divided by qb. The time period is 2 pi m by qb and the uh, pitch of helix is equal to v parallel times the time period. Okay, okay. now let us solve few problems based on this. Here we are, they are given us a beam of proton with a speed 4 times 10 to the power 5 meter per second and this enters a magnetic field of 0.3 tesla at an angle 60 degree to the magnetic field. So we have a magnetic field 0.3 tesla, the charge, the protons are entering the magnetic field with velocity v at an angle 60 degree. Okay. And they are asking us what is the pitch of the resulting helical path of proton is approximately. So, what we can do, we can make two components of velocity, one parallel to magnetic field as V cos 60, that is V by 2, and one perpendicular component as V sin 60, V root 3 by 2. Okay. Because of this, pitch forms, because of this, pitch forms, and the pitch is given by the V parallel times time period, V parallel is V by 2 and time period is 2 pi m by qb. You know the mass of proton, the mass of proton is this, the charge of proton is this, so you know the value of m and q, you know the value of magnetic field as 0.3 tesla, you know the value of velocity which is 4 times 10 to the power 5, so you know everything here. If you calculate carefully, you will get an approximately 4 centimeter as an answer. It is very close to 4. It's, it will be little more than 4, but the most suitable answer is 4. So, A option is the perfect choice. Okay. So, let us move further. And now we have another very unique concept in this chapter, which is force on current carrying element in magnetic field, obviously. So, as you know, when you place a moving charge in magnetic field, it experiences, it may experience a force. So, what is current? Current is also a flow of charge. So, if a wire has uh, current in it, current flowing in it, the flowing charge, the flowing charge may experience a magnetic force in magnetic field. And if the charges within the wire are experiencing magnetic force, this magnetic force can be considered as the force on the wire. Okay. So, obviously, current carrying wire experiences a magnetic force in magnetic field. So, suppose we have a tiny current element, it has a current I in it going towards right. The length of that element is dl. We have considered dl as a vector and the direction of dl is the, the same as direction of I. And let us say there is a magnetic field at an angle theta. Okay. So, you can consider as the current is flowing towards right, we can consider dq charge flows in length dl in time dt. The dq charge flows in length dl in time dt and the uh, let us say velocity of dq is simply v, you can write the force, the magnetic force on that dq charge. Let us call this magnetic force as dm. Okay. So, as the magnetic force on moving charge is given by q v cross b, the df would be dq velocity vector cross b. 
as the charge moves a dl distance in time dt we can write dq v as dl vector let's put the displacement vector dl divided by dt cross b and if you bring dq by dt together you will have dq by dt as current so it becomes i times dl cross b so if we have a tiny current element having current i and length l okay placed in a magnetic field b the element experiences element may experience a force df and that force equals i times dl cross p the dl is a uh, you can say the length factor of the element and direction of dl is in the same direction as that of current okay so that is the case when we place a small element but what if we want to find the force on a big wire so there are very important cases when we put a big wire in uniform magnetic field first so let us discuss them one by one so first i am considering the magnetic field is uniform and if in uniform magnetic field you place a long a uh, uh, straight wire and we are calculating a force on a straight wire so suppose we have a straight wire like this the current is like this and this is placed in a uniform magnetic field as we do not know the force on complete wire but we do know the force on its one tiny element so let's take let's divide this entire wire into many tiny elements and one such element is this dl as dl is a vector let's take dl is pointing upward as current is pointing upward and the force on this tiny dl will be given by df equals i dl vector cross b vector okay similarly we can find force on every tiny element of it and if we add all the forces vectorially we will be able to find the net force experienced by this wire okay so obviously the net force would be vector integral of all ds and let's do integral i dl cross p now notice every element is carrying the same current because current is same throughout the wire so every element is carrying the same current and magnetic field is uniform everywhere so every element is placed in uniform same magnetic field so you can take i and b outside this integration sign but never flip the order so we have i integral dl let's put in bracket and cross b and what would be integral dl if you add all these dls you can consider dl as a small displacement along the wire you will get a vector summation of all dl as the net displacement of current from entering point to the leaving point the net displacement of current from entering point to the leaving point suppose entering point of current is a and the leaving point of current is b so this vector we get as ab vector okay or you can say it as l vector so always remember here l vector is a direct displacement of current from entering point to the leaving point okay and let's write this force f as i l cross b if the magnetic field is uniform is non uniform then you have no choice to integrate uh, all dfs to, or to add all dfs vectorially in uh, with separate mathematics using separate situations but if magnetic field is uniform you can apply this formula directly let us see some other case suppose again we have a uniform magnetic field and now we have placed a twisted wire a non straight wire in that magnetic field okay so suppose we have this kind of wire
करंट इज एंटरिंग फ्रॉम ए एंड लीविंग फ्रॉम बी दिस इज करंट आई एंड देर देर वी हैव अ यूनिफॉर्म मैग्नेटिक फील्ड बी द मैग्नेटिक फील्ड इज यूनिफॉर्म Again, if you take a tiny element in this uh, wire, you can find force on that tiny element as df equals i dl cross b. Okay, and again by summing all forces vectorially, you get net force on the wire. So net force is simply integral i dl cross b. Again here. in this case also we have same i in all elements we have same magnetic field in all elements so i can take i and b common this is dl so let us see what is integral dl now say the first dl will be like this the second will be like this the third may be like this third fourth may be like this and all these are all dls but you add all these vectors vectorially okay so what we have to do when we have to add many vectors we arrange them as large number of sides of a polynomial okay every new vector is starting from the head of the previous vector and we started from point a and we ended at point b now if we want to draw the resultant means the summation the vector summation of all dl we have to make we have to uh, draw this vector ab vector okay and ab vector is the resultant of all dls okay so here again let us say ab vector is l vector and you can write it as i l vector cross b vector as net force means here it is not important what is the shape of the wire only if you know the starting point of the wire and ending point of the wire or the entering point of the current and the leaving point of the current just join these two points with a vector l and the force on entire wire will be same as i l cross b okay only the net displacement of current vector is required okay, okay. next case suppose we have a current loop placed in a uniform magnetic field so suppose we have a current loop placed in a magnetic field like this what is the net magnetic force on it magnetic field is still uniform okay see if you look at the previous case and i bring this point b yes to the point a and make a closed loop if i make a closed loop the entering point of current and the leaving point of current will be same and the net displacement net integral dl vector will be zero at as this length of l vector ab vector will be zero because the two points are not different now they form a closed loop so entering point of current and leaving point of current is same so vector sum of all dl is zero you can see here also if you starts at some point and integrate all these dl so all these dl's vector sum will be zero because last dl vectors head will terminate at the tail of first dl vector so the summation of all vector dl will be zero and that is why the net force as the net force in uniform magnetic field is given by i integral dl vector cross b vector and this summation this integral dl is zero as the net displacement of current is zero the starting point and ending point of current are same so net integral dl is zero so we get f net equals 0 so always remember in uniform magnetic field in uniform magnetic field the net force on a current loop is zero but remember 
it experiences a torque and it has a potential energy in magnetic field. Let me remind you, if you have a current loop, if you have a current loop, the current loop is similar to a magnetic moment. The current loop has a magnetic moment m. The m is given by m vector is given by n i a vector. The number of turns, the current and the area. Okay. The direction of area vector is given by right hand rule. You curl your fingers in the direction of current and this thumb will give you the direction of area and also the direction of magnetic moment. So, this current loop is similar to a magnet and it has a magnetic moment equal to n i a. If you place such loop in a uniform magnetic field B, it experiences a torque. Remember, force is zero, but it experiences a torque, and the torque is given by m cross b. Remember, it is given by m cross b, and the magnitude of torque is m b sine theta. As electrodipole moment, as electric dipole moment experiences a force zero, but torque equals to p cross e or p e sin theta in electric field, it experiences again a torque equals to m cross b or m sin theta in magnetic field. And it also has a potential energy, potential energy. And the potential energy of dipole, magnetic dipole or current carrying loop in uniform magnetic field is given by minus m dot b or simply minus m b sin theta. First, we will learn if we have a magnet or a current carrying loop. Let me remind you, the magnets and the current carrying loop have similar nature. If we have a current carrying loop, it has a magnetic moment m equals to n i a and it is similar to a magnet. Okay. Magnets also have magnetic moment okay, m. So, at the place of this magnet, we can also have a current carrying loop okay, and the uh, function of both is same, the effect on both is same if you place them in magnetic field. Okay. So, suppose we have a magnet or a current carrying loop having magnetic moment m and the direction of magnetic moment m makes an angle theta with direction of magnetic field B. So, here we have a magnetic magnet or a current carrying loop having magnetic moment m. And as it is making some angle with magnetic field, it will experience a torque, it will experience a magnetic torque tau equals to m b sin theta. The torque can be written as moment of inertia times alpha equals to m b sin theta. And now you know the angular acceleration is proportional to m b by i sin theta. So, angular acceleration is proportional to sin theta. But if you really take this theta to be nearly 0 or very small or very small, you now know the sine theta and theta are nearly equal if theta is very small. So, I can write this alpha as m b divided by i theta. Okay. And if you take the theta to be anti-clockwise, can you see the theta is anti-clockwise? Then the torque will be in the direction to pull this magnetic moment along magnetic field. So, this is the sense of torque acting. 
the magnetic torque always acts to make the magnetic movement come along magnetic field. So, the uh, torque and angular displacement are actually in opposite direction if you take directions into account. So, obviously, if you taking, if you convert this into a vector equation, the angular acceleration and angular displacements are equal, okay, because angular displacement is anti-clockwise and the torque or angular acceleration is clockwise. And can you see it is similar to the standard equation of SHM and where you can write the angular frequencies square as mb upon i or the time period as 2 pi square root of i upon mb. So, if a current carrying loop or a magnet having magnetic moment m are placed in uniform magnetic field making a very tiny angle theta with magnetic field, they start oscillating. And the oscillations are nearly SHM if theta is really small and the time period of that simple harmonic motion is given by 2 pi root of i upon mb. So, remember this uh, result and that is a very important result. Let us use this in this question. Here they say they have a magnetic needle. Okay. Magnetic needle is also a tiny magnet and it has a magnetic moment. So, it has a magnetic moment. Let us say this is magnetic moment m. And moment of inertia, this, and it is performing simple harmonic motions, uh, oscillations in magnetic field of 0 0.01 Tesla. So, this is the magnetic field. What is the time taken for 10 complete oscillations? So, obviously, time taken for 10 complete oscillations will be 10 times 1 time period, and 10 times the 1 time period is 2 pi square root of i divided by mb. You know the value of moment of inertia, the magnetic moment and the value of magnetic field. Put all these here and take some approximate calculations and you will notice the time period will be, would be approximately 0.6647 uh, something and if you multiply it by 10, the, uh, the approximately you will find 6.65 as answer. So, correct answer is B 6.65 seconds. Okay. Next question. Here we have a hoop. Hoop means hoop means a current carrying loop. Okay. And a solid cylinder. We also have a solid cylinder of same mass and radius. So, mass are same and radius are also same. Okay. The radius are also same. The magnetic, they are made of permanent magnetic materials with their magnetic moment parallel to their axis. So, both have magnetic moment and it is given that magnetic moment of hoop is twice that of solid cylinder. Means, if the hoop has magnetic moment m, the, if the cylinder has magnetic moment m, the hoop will be having magnetic moment equal to 2m. And if they are placed in uh, magnetic field, making a small angle with the field, they both will oscillate and their oscillations will be nearly angular SHM. So, if their time periods are Th and Tc, Th for time period of hoop and Tc is for time period of the solid cylinder. We have to compare Th upon Tc or we have to tell them Th in terms of Tc. Okay. So, let us write the formula. As you know, the time period is given by 2 pi root i upon mb. As magnetic moment is different and as moment of inertia will too be different, okay, because one is hoop, hoop means a hollow ring type of hoop and one is solid cylinder. So, moment of inertia is different, magnetic moment is different, rest everything is same. You can write T hoop divided by T c as 2 pi will get cancelled, B will be cancelled, I hoop 
upon I cylinder multiplied by M cylinder divided by M hoop. As hoop is a hollow ring or ring, I can take the moment of inertia of hoop as, let me write it again, Th by Tc equals, moment of hoop can be written as mr square and moment of inertia of cylinder can be written as mr square by 2, so 2 will go up, okay. And as the magnetic moment of hoop is twice of magnetic moment of cylinder, the magnetic moment of cylinder can be written as m and magnetic moment of hoop can be written as 2m. So, all these things get cancelled out, 2 and 2 got cancelled out, we have 1 in the right hand side. So, TH and TC are equal and the correct option is B, okay. So, let us move a little. Now, we have a next question as a 250 turn rectangular coil of length 2.1 centimeter and width 1.25 centimeter carries a current of 85 micro ampere. So, we have a current coil having 250 number of turns, uh, it, it is actually a rectangular coil. So, it is having 250 number of turns, the length and width is given and the current carrying by current, this uh, coil is also given as I, which is 85 micro ampere. It is subjected to a magnetic field, okay, it is subjected to a magnetic field. So, let us say the magnetic field is like this. They have not given the direction of magnetic field. So, I am taking magnetic field perpendicular to the plane of the uh, loop and pointing outward. Okay. And if this is the magnetic field, this loop has some potential energy. The potential energy, the initial potential energy is given by minus m b cos theta. So, minus m, m is actually n, i and area and b and as I have taken magnetic field outside, the magnetic moment is also outside. So, cos theta is 1. So, you, we have u initial like this and what if we flip this coil by 180 degrees? If we flip the coil by 180 degrees, the magnetic moment vector which is outward goes inward and the angle between magnetic field and magnetic moment now becomes 180 which was 0 initially. So, finally, the potential energy will become minus m, we can write m as n i a b and cos 180, what is cos 180 minus 1? So, we have n i a b, okay. And now, as you know, the work done equals the work done equals u final minus u initial, it will become 2 n i a b. Put the value of n as 250, i as 85 times 10 to the power minus 6 ampere, the area as uh, multiplication of length and width converted into meters and the magnetic field as 0.85 tesla. So, you have all the values here you can easily calculate the work done and it will nearly be 9.1 microjoule. So, correct answer is A, okay. Next, now we will discuss the force between parallel wires, the force between parallel wire. So, we, if we have two parallel wires like this, carrying current say I1 and I2, Obviously, each wire is placed in magnetic field of other okay. and if each wire is placed in magnetic field of other, each one may experience a force, a magnetic force. Okay. So, let us try to calculate that magnetic force. Suppose the wire 1 is here and wire 2 is here. Obviously, the 2 wire is placed in magnetic field of 1. So, I will calculate, I will try to find the what is magnetic field at the place of wire 2 because of 1. So, let us say the distance between them is D and as the current is 
upward, I have assumed it upward, the magnetic field at the place of the wire 2 will be inward. So, magnetic field here is inward, B is inward and B can be written as mu naught I 1 divided by 2 pi D, right. Okay. Now, if we know the current here, if we, uh, the wire here, obviously this wire is going to experience a force and the force on a L length wire is given by I L cross P, I think you remember. So, let me take a length L of this wire, let us say this is the length L of the wire, the entry point of current is this, the leaving point of current is this. So, you can call this L as vector L okay. and magnetic force on this wire of length L is given by F equals to I I, the current is I2 here, L cross B. So, L, B and S, L vector is upward, the B vector is inward, the angle between L vector and B vector is 90 degree. So, we have L B sin 90 degrees. So, we have, let us put the value of B as mu naught I1 I2 we already have divided by 2 pi d times L. So, this is actually the force on L length of the wire. So, if you do not have both wires infinitely long, if you have any one wire infinitely long and other wire finitely long, and then in that case also you can find magnetic force between them because uh, for finding magnetic field the magnetic field at the place of this wire should be uniform and for this the other wire, the one wire, at least one wire should be infinitely long. Okay. So, now we know force on L length of the wire. So, if we try to calculate force on unit length of wire, I can differentiate this with respect to L and that dF by dL that is force on unit length of the wire would be mu naught I 1 I 2 divided by 2 pi t. So, this is the force on unit length of the wire, please try to remember and let us solve few questions based on this. Here we are given that a square loop of A B C D length L is carrying a current i, is carrying a current i, a small i here, can you see that? And there is a long wire x y carrying a current capital I in upward direction and uh, the locations, the sizes, the dimensions are given and they are asking us what is the net force on the loop, what is the net force on the loop, okay. There is one thing I should, uh, I, uh, I would like to mention here, if you see the direction of force, the direction of force is actually in the direction of L cross B as L is upward and B is inward, the force is towards left. And according to Newton's third law, the force on left wire should to be towards right as they are action reaction pair. So, remember if the two wires have parallel currents, have currents in same direction. If the two parallel wires have currents in same direction, the force is attracted. And if the currents flip, if one of the current flips and the two wires carry current in opposite direction, force is of repulsion. So, same direction current, attractive force. Opposite direction current, repulsive force. So, let us come to this point. This is a long wire and we have wire AB. If you look at wire AB, this current and this current are in same direction. So, AB wire is going to experience an attractive force, let us say F1 because of long wire. And the CD wire, the CD wire has current downward and in this wire we have current upward. So, CD wire will experience a repulsive force, let us say F2 this. F2 will be definitely smaller than F1 as this wire is farther from 
the long wire and AB is closer from the long wire. Okay. That is why F1 should be bigger than F2. Let us talk about the wire DC and AD also. As the magnetic field of long wire is non-uniform as you go away from it, it decreases. So, BC wire is not placed in uniform magnetic field. Okay. BC wire because as you move away from the, if you move from B to C, you are moving away from the long wire and the magnetic field is decreasing. So, obviously, if you see the DL element on BC is towards right because current is towards right. Magnetic field is inward. So, DL cross B, DL cross B, DL is the direction rightward and B is inward. We have magnetic force on BC wire like this. Okay. But as we go away and we take a next DL element, the magnetic force on it will be smaller because here magnetic field is lower. As you th think of the next element here, the magnetic force is still smaller. As we are moving away, the magnetic field is decreasing. And similarly, if you see on the AD wire, you will see the magnetic force like this. So, magnetic force on BC and AD are not uniform, are not uniformly distributed. But they are cancelling each other because on the left part, we have bigger force cancelling force. On the right part, we have a smaller force, but both cancelling force. The pattern of this force and this force is same. So, they will cancel each other equally. So, the net force would be simply F1 minus F2. So, F net would be F1 minus F2. As we know the formula, the force on L length of wire is mu naught I1 I2 by 2 pi dL. I can write the F1 as mu naught i i divided by 2 pi, the d is l by 2 here, l by 2 here and the length is l. This is the force f1 minus f2 as mu naught i i divided by 2 pi. The length from here to here is 3 l by 2 and l. Okay, If you calculate this, you will get 2 mu naught i i by 3 pi as an answer. So, obviously, the A is the right choice. Okay. Next question. The next question is again about the force between parallel wires. Can you see it is very important concept, the force between parallel wires. Always remember, if we have two parallel wires, both are long or one has uh, infinite length, one has short length, then the force can be calculated. The force on unit length is given by mu naught i1 i2 pi 2 pi d and the force on length L can be given by force on unit length multiplied by length L. Okay. So, here we have three wires. Actually, the wires are placed perpendicularly to the screen. So, we can see them only at their cross section. So, we have one wire here at A one wire at B and one wire at C. All three are having currents pointing outward. Okay. So, we have to calculate net force on B per unit length. We have to find net force per unit length on the middle wire B. So, as you know, the force per unit length DF by DL equals mu naught See the current is I, here also we have current I. So, mu naught I I as I square divided by I square divided by 2 pi D. And as the currents are in same direction, the force would be attractive. So, we have this as force on wire B, on per unit length of wire B. Similarly, as C will also attract B as C and B two have same uh, direction current, same current. So, C would also apply the same force on B like this and obviously as the two forces are at 90 degree, the net force is given by any one force mu naught I square divided by 2 pi D times root 2. 
So it will be obviously mu naught i square by root 2 pi d and we have mu naught i square by root 2 pi d in the option d. So d is the right choice. So it's access. So suppose you have a tiny current loop having current i number of turns n and the area of loop as a. You know the magnetic moment is given as n i a. So we are assuming that we have a tiny current loop placed here. The axis of loop is this and this tiny loop is similar to a magnet. So let us say we can also have a magnet here of having some magnetic moment m. So if no, we know the magnetic moment either of a current carrying loop or of a magnet, we know the magnetic field at every point in the space assuming the magnet or the loop is tiny or very small in size. So if you want to know the magnetic moment, sorry magnetic field at axis at some distance r from the loop or magnet. So this field is along magnetic moment remember the magnetic field on axis is parallel to magnetic moment and magnetic field on axis is given by 2 k m divided by r cube. The magnetic field on axis is given by 2 k m by r cube where m is magnetic moment and k is actually the constant mu naught upon 4 pi. You can compare the result with an electric dipole and in case of electric dipole you must have remembered that if we have an electric dipole P, the electric field on axis is given by 2 kp by r cube. So simply you have to replace the electric dipole moment by magnetic dipole moment P by M and the 1 pi 4, 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught the k becomes mu naught by 4 pi here. So this is the magnetic field on the axis and if you wish to know magnetic field on transverse axis or equator at a distance r from it, remember the r should be very large, very very large as compared to the size of magnet or the loop. So here what we see that the magnetic moment is towards right, can you see that? But the magnetic field is towards left, so B on equator is in the opposite direction of is parallel to you can say minus m. So it is in opposite direction of m and this is given by k m by r cube. This result is also similar to the uh, electric field of dipole on transverse axis which was k p by r cube. Okay. So can you see the magnetic field at a distance r on axis is twice that of magnetic field at a distance r on transverse axis and in the opposite direction. So just remember the results and by comparing the results of dipole and the magnetic dipole you can also find electric magnetic field at, at, at any space of time at any point of space. Okay. So let us solve this very interesting question from J. Main 2019 and it says we have a infinitely long current carrying wire and a small current carrying loop are in the plane of the paper paper as shown. So we have a tiny loop here, we have a long carrying current here. The radius of the loop is A and a distance of its center from the wire is D. So this distance is D, the radius of loop is A and the loop radius is much smaller than the distance D. If the force applied, if the loop applies a force F on the wire, the f is proportional to, we have to check the proportionality of f. Okay. So for this, I will consider this is a loop having current say i. If it has current i, obviously the magnetic moment becomes i times area and area is pi a square, remember. So magnetic moment of loop can be written as i times pi a square, do not forget. And as this is the loop 
if I take one element of wire as dy at a distance y from this reference, okay, and if I join this by this, like this, if you see the flow of current, the flow of current is like this. So, magnetic moment is inward, right? So, magnetic moment is inward, direction of magnetic moment is inward, and as this is the axis of the loop, okay. So, you can say this as transverse axis, this as transverse axis, and at transverse axis here, the magnetic field is in opposite direction to the magnetic moment. So, here we will be having magnetic field outward. If, we, if I consider this distance as r and this angle as theta, right, this angle as theta, I can write the magnetic field B at the place of loop as B equals k, k is, remember k is mu naught by 4 pi k m divided by r q, okay. And the magnetic force on this element dy magnetic force on is element dy that can be written as the current in the wire let us say capital I dy and magnetic field k m divided by r q right as the dy is in this plane and magnetic field is, is outside the angle between dy and b is 90 so sin to sin 90 we can place 1. Let me replace y and r with the help of theta. So, I can write y by d as tan theta. So, y can be written as d tan theta. So, dy can be written as sec square theta d theta, right. And obviously, I can write d by r as cos theta. So, r will be d divided by cos theta. So, I can replace this expression as i k m dy by, sorry, I forgot to write d here. So, dy by small d sec square theta d theta divided by r cube and r cube is d cube sec cube theta. You can cancel sec square theta and sec uh, square theta from the numerator and denominator and you will be left with, let us write d f as, yes, i k m d by d cube is 1 upon d e square. So, we have i k m divided by d e square and cos theta d theta. If you integrate the entire result, okay. So, obviously, integration of cos theta and d theta will give you a constant, okay, will give you a numerical constant. In m, if I place the value of m, we will have i k m as i and pi a square by d square and some numerical constant, which will be obtained after integration. So, if you complete the integration, the force will be like this. And as we have to check the only the proportionality, can you see f is, pro, f is proportional to a square by d square. So, f is proportional to a square by d square. So, correct answer is a, okay. Let us move further. Now, we will study about galvanometer. You have studied about galvanometer in uh, the chapter of current electricity. There you studied what is the purpose of galvanometer, how it is converted to ammeter and voltmeter. But I said earlier that the working principle is based on the principle of magnetism. So, here we will study how it works. So, in this galvanometer, we have a soft iron cylinder. We call it soft iron core. And on this soft iron core, we wrap a coil we wrap a coil. This is the main coil and it moves with the cylinder 
so it is also called a moving coil galvanometer it is it is also called a moving coil galvanometer moving coil or mc galvanometer that is moving coil galvanometer let's say the coil has n number of turns let's say the width and length of coil are b and l so we know the area of coil as b times l okay and if i send a current i in it the coil becomes a magnet of magnetic moment m n i a okay so the so uh, whichever current we have to measure whichever current we have to measure we send in this coil and when we send this coil a current to be measured it becomes a tiny magnet of magnetic moment n i a and as it is placed in magnetic field can you see it is being placed in magnetic field created by these permanent magnets in the magnetic field the coil experiences a torque a magnetic torque and magnetic torque is given by m b sin theta so we have n a i b m b sin theta by a special design of these poles and using the soft iron here we have created the field to be almost radial and as can you see the magnetic field and coil are in same plane as the magnetic moment is perpendicular to coil you can say the angle between magnetic field and magnetic moment this is the magnetic moment this is the magnetic field angle between magnetic moment and magnetic field is 90 okay so we can write sin theta as sin 90 and which is 1 and what radial magnetic field does suppose this coil turns like this okay when the coil turns like this the magnetic moment will be like this but here we see magnetic field like this so because of radial magnetic field we can always set the angle between the magnetic moment and magnetic field for uh, 90 degree so if angle between magnetic field and magnetic moment is always 90 we can forget about this sign term and we can say the torque the magnetic torque is given by b i n a b na okay this is the magnetic torque when because of this torque the coil turns this core also turns and a spring is connected with the core so that spring got twisted that spring got twisted and because of that twist theta in a spring an opposite torque develops that is k times theta this is the spring torque okay and when the spring torque becomes equal to the magnetic torque there the coil stops or the soft core stops okay so let's say at theta the two becomes equal and when they becomes equal at equilibrium you can say theta equals to b and a divided by k i so this is the angular displacement of coil a pointer is connected with this coil and that also turns with the coil and by looking at the displacement angular displacement of pointer we can measure this theta and if this theta can be measured you, we know uh, if this constant the i can be measured that is the working principle of galvanometer okay so here uh, what happens we put the current to be measured in the coil the coil becomes a magnet the magnet turns in magnetic field created by poles because of this turning uh, the coil the spring at associated with coil twists a spring develops an opposite torque k theta when these two magnetic and spring torque becomes equal we measure the angular displacement with the help of this pointer and by measuring the angular displacement the current is calculated or you can say measured so that's why the measurement of current is possible there is one thing i think you remember when you place a magnet in a magnetic field at the point of equilibrium it makes some oscillations 
so this coil may also oscillates for a little while and then will make a stop and then and and when it stops you can measure or you can take readings so it is very important that the coil stops quickly so that we can take readings quickly we don't have to wait for long okay and for that there are few damping supplied so uh, sometimes we use air damping or oil damping but here we use electromagnetic damping that will be uh, uh, I, i'll be teaching you that in next chapter so but damping is a very important part of this galvanometer okay so uh, there is one more thing as the i is input the current that you sent in the coil is input and theta you see is the output okay the d theta divided by di di is called current sensitivity current sensitivity the d theta is measured in uh, angles radians degrees or sometimes in number of divisions and current is measured in uh, milliampere or ampere so this is called current sensitivity we can represent it by si and by differentiating this result with respect to i you get d theta by di as b and a upon k so you know si equals b and a divided by k so if someone ask you how you can improve sensitivity you will say increase b increase number of turns increase number area of the coil or decrease a spring constant of the spring you will have is current sensitivity increased we also have voltage sensitivity because we can also measure voltage from here if i replace this current by v upon r from ohm's law we will have theta as b and a upon k and i as v by r i as v by r so here voltage is the input theta is the output and d theta by dv becomes voltage sensitivity and that will be actually b and a divided by k r so can you see it is simply sv is simply current sensitivity divided by r so we know voltage sensitivity equals to current sensitivity divided by resistance so now let us solve few problems based on them suppose we have a current sensitivity in a moving coil galvanometer that is galvanometer is 5 divisions per milliampere 5 divisions per milliampere uh, let us convert current sensitivity in si system so in si system if 1 milliampere creates a 5 divisions in a scale if only 1 milliampere creates 5 divisions 1000 milliampere that is 1 ampere will create 5000 divisions so i can say the current sensitivity is 5000 divisions per ampere that's a simple unitary method and voltage sensitivity is 20 divisions per volt so voltage sensitivity is 20 divisions per volt and they are asking you what is the resistance of galvanometer so as you know voltage sensitivity equals current sensitivity divided by r you now have r as current sensitivity which is 5000 divided by 20 and you will have 250 ohm as the resistance of the coil so you have c as correct answer next question suppose we have a galvanometer coil and it has 500 turns and each turn has an average area of this much meter square so we know the number of turns we know the area and torque is required to keep this coil parallel to magnetic field so if you have to keep the magnetic uh, the, the coil in some place a torque is applied obviously that torque that external torque is balancing the magnetic torque that is why torque is required so magnetic torque is simply bi 
एन ए ओके वी नो द टॉर्क हियर द टॉर्क इज दिस द नंबर ऑफ टर्न एंड एरिया आर गिवेन एंड वी नो द करेंट इज पॉइंट फाइव एम्पियर करेंट इज पॉइंट फाइव एम्पियर सो दे आर आस्किंग यू वॉट इज द स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ मैग्नेटिक फील्ड वॉट इज द वैल्यू ऑफ मैग्नेटिक फील्ड सो ऑब्वियसली वैल्यू ऑफ मैग्नेटिक फील्ड इज टॉर्क विच इज वन पॉइंट फाइव डिवाइडेड बाई आई एन ए द करेंट इज जीरो पॉइंट फाइव एम्पियर द नंबर ऑफ टर्न आर फाइव हंड्रेड ओके एंड एरिया इज थ्री टाइम्स टेन टू द पावर माइनस फोर सो कैलकुलेट दिस लेट एस सी हाउ वॉट वी गेट दिस गॉड कैंसल वी गेट थ्री 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 ऑल्सो कैंसल्ड सो we have one upon 0.05 one upon 0.05 as an answer so you multiply 100 uh, in numerator and denominator we will get 100 by 5 and 100 by 5 is 20 so the magnetic field required is 20 tesla okay so that's all for today thank you so much i hope you have learned a lot in this uh, session and i wish you all the best for your exams okay keep learning thank you thank you so much